I could not believe what I was seeing. I could have filled the back of his head with 556, which is an absolute joke. Well, it's not an ape, because if the Sasquatch was an ape, we would already have one. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. We have Sydney with us today. Sydney, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Tom, I'm going to have you kick this off. Yeah, Sydney, you and I spoke earlier this week, and we're fascinated by the uh, just the sheer volume of sightings and encounters that people are having up in the uh, Pacific, or not the Pacific, up <laughs> up in uh, in the Northeast. And you're in Vermont, uh, so you've had quite a bit of uh, you had some really interesting stories. So I'll just hand it off to you and start from the beginning. All right. Yeah, I've, I've never had the pleasure of seeing one physically, but uh, I've had several things happen that can't really explain, you know, as far as uh, being able to debunk it, I guess, as you'd say. But um, this is up in the northern corner of Vermont um, in a place what they call the North, uh, Northeast Kingdom uh, on the border of New Hampshire. And... Uh, Back about 2009, my dad bought a 16-acre parcel of land. Um, it was just all woods, you know, barely anybody around, uh, real remote, a lot of four-wheeler trails. And um, he bought it as a place to kind of just get away. Uh, he'd been overseas several times and just wanted a nice, quiet place to go to when he come home. So uh, I went up with him and cleared the land. They'd logged it, pro I would say, probably about 10 years prior to him purchasing it. So, you know, all the big the big lumber was gone, most of it, and there's a lot of real thick um, undergrowth had come up, a little small, I call them whips, uh, the small trees that grew up. So um, I guess the first thing that happened, I went up and uh, I was best man in a wedding, so we were having the bachelor party up here and had a bunch of guys come up and, and we rode four wheelers around and uh, later that night dad had a like an army tent with a bunch of cots set up in it for all of us to sleep in and uh, had dinner and shooting the breeze around the fire and everyone kind of one by one goes to bed so helped dad clean up and then, then uh, I was the last one to lay down and uh, Across, it, I can't tell you how far away it was. It it was pitch black; couldn't see anything. I just get laid down, and all of a sudden, the loudest ruckus I've ever heard in the woods started coming. What sounded like directly at us, and uh, you know, I prior to this point, I didn't really know much about Bigfoot or Sasquatch or any of that. So first thing that come to mind that could make a racket like that was a moose. And uh, so I just lay in there. Of course, everyone's asleep. And, uh, of course, I'm the only one awake listening. But, like, couldn't believe the noise. Um, because it was so dark, of course, your mind kind of just plays plays games with you. So, you know, I just picture in the size of the trees, it sounded like they were breaking. And if you know soft that, that was trees my question. when they're... When they're, I'm when they're just going to jump dead. in real quick. Yeah. Right. Oh, I just want to jump in real quick. You said they were making a racket. So that's what it was. It was, was it crashing through? Did it sound like it was moving fast? Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the racket. Yeah. What, what described that for us? It, it was, the way I imagined it was if some, something had picked a direction in the woods it wanted to go and whatever was in its path was, was, it was going to go through it is what it sounded like. Uh, Big, small, in between. Uh, it just 
the the noise of the crashing and the breaking of the wood uh, was so intense. You know, it it drowned out any chance of hearing footsteps or um, you know, and it kind of just took me off guard. So I was drawn back by the sheer sound of it. And uh, so what I pictured was big softwood trees when they're real dead and all the barks come off and any litter that was on them has come off. Um, you know, when you get up to them in the woods and you rock them a little bit and then you push them over, the sound of that crashing, that's what it sounded like, but so much louder. And uh, so I thought it was coming right at us and I'm laying there wondering, you know, what point of the tent's going to start moving first. And it, it comes down by and goes right by and it just stops silent. No other noise, nothing. That was it. Um, I just couldn't believe it. And the next morning I got up and I asked everybody that was there, I said, geez, you guys must've heard that. Didn't anybody hear what? And they all kind of looked at me like, I'd had a bad dream or something. No one heard it but me, of course. So that was uh, that was something. So when it stopped, um, did it stop like by your campsite or or it where, went where, down whereabouts just, do you just think a little it was? Ways. Uh, I'd okay. say it probably went twenty, thirty yards past where we were, and then just stopped. And then that was it. You didn't hear. You didn't hear it continue. Or do anything after that? Not a, nothing. I, I just couldn't believe it. It's like, you know, you almost wondered, well, did it just stop way down there? <laughs> and, you know, now thinking back about it, I wish the next morning I'd got up and gone over and looked where I thought it was, tried to see something. Or, I mean, it must have it must have left a path of destruction by the sound of it. But Yeah, that's a good point to go over there and check it out, but... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. I how and how far from your tent to where? What would you estimate the distance to this crashing? Uh, you know, uh, at, at its very closest point. Yeah, uh, what it sounded like was just on the other side of the tent, the canvas. <laughs> I mean, it, okay. it was loud, right. and I mean, it probably wasn't reality. It was most likely across the road, which was probably. 50 yards from the tent um, or across the road at that point. And, uh, but uh, just so loud, never heard anything like it. Yeah. And, and have you spent a little bit of time in the woods so you would know if it was a deer, elk, moose? Yeah. And, you know, I, and I thought it was a moose, but then, you know, this is like 11 o'clock at night. What, what would a moose be doing out terrorizing through the, woods like that at that time of night for you know you think they'd have a little better way to around than that but yeah it's a very good point and i'm i mean I, I i don't have any experience with moose but i have experience with deer and elk um they uh, prey animals will they'll walk a little bit and then they'll stop and listen walk right. they have a pattern to their yeah to their walking that um Time and again, what we've heard with involved the creatures is like somebody took a D9 caterpillar and let it just <laughs> took it out of gear, put it neutral, right? And just let it go down the hill. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the next day you get up, you, hey, you know, talk to the uh, people you're camping with. Hey, guys, uh, did you hear anything? And they didn't hear anything. No, not a word. And I, I just. I remember laying there waiting for someone to go, what was that? Nothing. And the next morning, that just phased like nothing ever happened. <laughs> Made me kind of feel alone, you know. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, you know, I, I and also understand when you're out camping, there's times when you just, you're exhausted, and boom, you're just out like a light. So I think that's a common yeah. occurrence. Yeah. And so I fell asleep shortly after, so. Oh really? Okay. And you yeah. uh, you said this was what time at night? Oh, I'd say around well, eleven o'clock. Around eleven o'clock, okay. Yeah, that's all right. 
So you've had a couple of other um, stories or, or some, some uh, I guess, encounters or stories that you had. Go ahead and uh, let's, yeah, let's, let's hear about those. Yeah, so in the uh, years past, what I just told you, the, uh, my dad started clearing out the land, making a place. He bought himself a camper tow behind and to put up on his land so he could go up and have some comforts while he's up there. And um, so we made a big area where he parked it. And then, you know, where it was was a fairly flat area. So he decided that, you know, it went up another plateau behind where his camper was. And he, he said, you know, I like it here, but I'd kind of like to be up, up and back a little bit. So a little further out. And so I went up uh, one fall and I, I cut a road for him with my chainsaw wide enough to get him up through and the next spring he started cutting or uh, using his tractor to make a road up through taking the trees and stumps and all that out of there and uh, so I went up to help him one day and I'm walking up through just kind of see how far he's made it so far and I'm walking back down something catches my eye and I look to the left and there's this um, balsam fir tree completely green and about, I'd say, two and a half, three feet off the ground, it is snapped parallel with the road he was making. Um, it's still attached, but just broke, you know, and laying on its side. Um, was the top part, like was it said, broken off? Was it green, the, the broken off part? Completely green. There wasn't any orange on it anywhere, and that's what was odd. Right. Well, one thing that was so odd is it was all green, so it was healthy, and all the trees around it were hardwood, and they were probably twenty to twenty-five feet taller than that tree was. So that that takes the wind factor out of it, as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, uh, I just I couldn't and, and, imagine what it would be. Well, and it must have been fresh. The top is still yeah. green, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that was odd. And up, up around the corner on the flat where he'd been um, chewing out some more area, a bunch of little small saplings, um, probably 15, 20 foot uh, in length. And they were all, um, oh, how do I describe it? If you had a big, circular area and so many trees from the area were all pulled into the center you know what i'm saying kind of uh none of them were broken they're all just kind of bent down um i got pictures of them but you know it, it is kind of a little muddy area but like i said i wasn't really looking it's just interesting that right on the edges of the road there was these signs almost like you know don't don't go any further you know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And so you're, there was enough of these that are broken down. You said they kind of formed uh, like a circle or? Yeah, there was. There, so it pulled a bunch of them into a point, And then just a little further up, there was a whole bunch of them pushed into kind of like a pile, you know. Um, but they weren't broke off. That was the funny thing. It's like, well, how would these even get in this position? You know, without some help. And I mean, the guy on the other side of him, he lives there year round, but he's, he's, you know, he's got a job. And <laughs> I don't think he'd be out there messing around playing tricks or anything. So just uh, kind of odd occurrences. Now, this is a rural area that this happens? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so on the drive up, from the blacktop once you leave the pavement um i think you pass maybe if you pass 10 houses on the way uh, that's a lot um and it's quite a distance so and once you get up to the road he's on there's only um three two or three livable places and i only think two of them they live there year round um so, yeah, it's pretty sparse. There ain't a lot of people. You know, you get a lot of four-wheelers and ATVs, side-by-sides, all that, riding in the summertime. But um, 
you know, other than that, well, this there's not a lot of people that are there all the time. Yeah, so you really don't think that this is something that the neighbors did? No, no, no. And if it was, he'd have told us by now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So, and now how far from yeah. the tree break was this other thing? Uh, maybe, maybe uh, about 50, 60 feet from it, up around the corner. Okay, so probably a good chance that these two are connected. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so I got another little part to that. So last year, uh, my dad's got a good friend of his that went overseas with him a few times, and, and they help each other out all the time. And so he said, you know, he's talking about a, his land to him. He's like, man, it sounds nice. So he, he made a spot next to his camper for his buddy to back his in. And... um the first weekend that they, so they put it in one weekend, the next weekend they came back to stay in it. Well, when they got there and pulled in the driveway, right in front of his camper at the edge of the road, um, where he pulls into where he, his camper is, there was a white birch, same as the fir tree, but broke off, prob, uh, Dad said, about eight feet in the air, broken the same um I don't want to say it. In the same manner that the fir tree was broke off and laid across his driveway. Um, and that night when they were in the camper sleeping, he said both him and his wife sat right up in bed and it sounded like something was tapping on the on the window of the door of his camper. Just persistent, you know, pounding on it. Bah, 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 bah. And um, he said, you know, they kind of chalked it up to... Uh, you know, a window's blowing, the tree branch was hitting it or something. And uh, when he got up and went out the next morning, he said, there's nothing even close that could have done that and, and made the noise, you know, in the same manner that, that they heard. So, and that, and where he put the camper is on the side where the trees were, you know, laid parallel. So it's almost like he encroached on that, on that area. That's interesting. I have heard that before a couple of times where actually there was a situation here in Oregon where a guy was uh, staying at his dad's uh, cabin in central Oregon and had a virtually identical situation where something was actually it's it's spent most of the night tapping on windows, going around the, yeah. the cabin and tapping on it. So that's, um, yeah, you know pretty pretty interesting um All right how long ago did this happen you said this was 2009 um so when the when i noticed the tree um the trees uh, that was i would say 2012 and then the white birch i just told you about was last year 2020 oh right so this is okay so we're talking recent stuff what about your yeah. neighbors? Has is there any kind of history? Has anybody talked about uh, other odd occurrences, or has anybody seen footprints or or reported seeing one of these creatures? Yeah, so I talked to my dad last night um, and asked him because the cell service is really bad up there. I wanted to call his neighbor and talk to him, but it it's even worse than here, believe it or not. And um, so he was telling me that. You know, he's got recordings, he's got pictures, he's got footprint pictures of footprints in the snow, and, um, um, you know, he, he's always getting feelings of, of like he's being watched. Um, and he, he sees stuff all the time. And I just, I can't pick his brain enough when I go up. Um, and I told that, that hopefully this summer I want to get up there and, and see these things that he's got. But... Like I told you the other day, Tom, his wife does not like talking about it. So she's around. We kind of got to <laughs> turn our backs on her, and, and hopefully he'll tell me something. But, uh, yeah, he's he's seen and heard quite a bit up there. And uh, he actually last How far? Last year, the year How far before, away is he? From my dad's land? Yeah. He's, he's probably, um, if you go down the driveway, it's, a hundred feet and his driveway is. And if you're sitting at the camper, you can 
almost see his place through the woods, but not quite. It's it's oh, close enough to hear things, close. but you can't quite see him. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And they live there. And I around. apologize. I cut and, you. Uh, yeah. Okay. And I cut you off. You were about to say something um, interesting. Uh, yeah. I think last year, the year before, he was because he works up in Burlington, so he has to get up pretty early uh, to go to work. And he said uh, he left the house about four o'clock. But down the bottom of his driveway, turned right onto the road, which is just a one lane, and then hardly any traffic on it. And once he turned, his headlights hit one. He was standing right in the middle of the road. Um, I I don't have any more details. I, I would like a lot more, obviously. Um, I'd like to have him explain, you know, he saw it that close, what he saw, you know, what it looked like, and all of that. So it was uh, dark in color and, and very tall. But, uh, that, of course, I'm getting a third party from my dad, so I didn't uh, get all the details, you know. So. And do you know why, what the reason is your mom, is she just avoids the topic or? You mean his wife? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I know. I've heard them say several times that um, she will not stay there alone. Um, if a lot of, there was, I don't know if something happened, but for a while he was taking her um, to her mother's house on the way to work. And then he'd pick her up on the way home because she just didn't, she didn't feel comfortable up there by herself. Um, I don't know if it was just being alone and, and so remote in the woods or something did happen. I don't know if it was completely to do with, the goings on in the woods if maybe it was just being alone and being so far up away from everybody you know could have been but uh yeah okay she doesn't care to well be and, I, and i can understand sure and that could yeah. that could just add to anybody's feeling of anxiety or, or unease yeah okay yeah fair enough right. yeah yeah um so uh my dad actually had a sighting i was talking to him about it last night um this happened, uh, I'd say, in 2018. He was—he said he'd gone for a four-wheeler ride, and on his way back, he pulled up into his neighbor's driveway because he knew he was home, and he was out mowing his lawn. They were chatting, and his neighbor told me, he said, you know, I, I, I just keep getting this feeling like I'm being watched. He said, I don't. It happens. He said it comes and goes. I don't know if there's, you know, any reason for it. But they carried on the conversation. Dad headed back over and sat down in front of the fire um, over to his camp. And um, he's sitting there, and he said he could hear something moving in the woods on the other side of the camp, or there's a ridge that goes along. And he could hear it, something. He said it sounded bipedal, but it was far enough away he couldn't quite tell. And uh, he said, you know, he's always hearing things in the woods, so he didn't really think much about it and carried on just kept relaxing and sitting by the fire and then he said he started feeling like something was watching him just that odd feeling and uh so he kind of looked around and uh went back to the fire and he said he started getting the feeling again so he turned to his left up towards the road that i told you about before he was building to get back up on top a little further on that next ridge and he said, right where the road took a turn to the left, just past it, there was a, a kind of tall fir tree. And he said there was something standing behind it. And he said he could see from the shoulders to the knees. He said the head was behind a, a branch. And, you know, the, the way the land went, you couldn't see past. It kind of dropped off behind where it was standing. So it was, you know, he could just see to the knees. He said it was... Uh, Brownish, red in color, more more brown than red, and um, he said it just looked massive. Uh, and he so he looks at it for a minute, and then he looks back, and he, and he just kept doing that. He kept looking back and kind of studying it for a minute, and then he looked back at the fire. He said he did it probably three or four times. Of course, he said, this probably went on for 15 minutes. He said, it felt like 15 minutes, so I don't know if it was that long. And uh, he said, 
probably the fifth or sixth time. When he turned back, he said it was gone. Never heard it leave, just as silent as could be. And uh, he said he never felt, um, oh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Never felt threatened, uh, just almost like it was just an observation. He was he was trying to figure it out as much as it was him. Um, and I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah very much so. I've, I've, I've experienced that. I know Will has, and it's a very common feeling. And you know what I find interesting is uh, I'm trying to think of the mechanics involved and, you know, how do you feel that somebody's watching you? You know, we have five right. senses, right? How do you, yeah. how do you, how does that work? I, I don't know how that works, right. but it yeah. s- does seem to happen. Yeah. I mean, I've even had it with people. It, I, I, you got to wonder. You know, when your mother used to say, I got eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> Maybe yeah, that's moms. Does. They do. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that is true. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. my mom certainly did. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting trait. Uh, I think somebody explained to me the, uh, probably the best explanation was, you know, when you pull up to a traffic signal, you know, two lane, and there's a car next to you, if you yeah. Look at them; they'll turn around and look back at you because they know they're being. But I, right. I don't know. I don't think that's. I don't know if that's the same thing or not. Right. Um, yeah. Well, this is interesting, and I'll, I'll tell you what: we got to stay in touch. And if you get some information from your dad, or even if you could even get him to come over, and if he'd be interested in, in also being interviewed, uh, we'd love to hear yeah. from him. That is absolutely okay. fascinating. Yeah. And you've got my email. If you want to, send me the picture uh, that you have. Okay. Have you got a couple of them? Yeah. yeah, send them my way, and, and I'm going to post them on our website, creekdevil.com, and okay. uh, we'd love to see them. All right. Well, I appreciate, appreciate talking with you guys. Sydney, we Give appreciate your time. your time. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Will. Nice to meet you, too. It was a lot of fun. I appreciate All right. you guys. Yeah, very much so. Absolutely. We're going to have you back. Thanks, Sydney. Okay. Thank you. Welcome back from the break, everyone. We have Dan and Ross joining us for this segment. Tom, do you want to go ahead and do the honors? Yeah, I'll go ahead and do a quick intro here. Uh, Dan, Ross, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. And uh, we're going to start off with uh, Dan's encounter. It is it is not only fascinating, it's been featured in uh, Witness of the Unknown. So it's a, it's a very interesting story. Uh, we're going to hear it firsthand from Dan, so I'm handing it off to you, and and let's uh, let's let's go from from there. Okay, this is Dan. Thanks for having me on. <clears throat> you know, I'm not exactly sure which story it was. I have a couple from that area. Oh, we want to hear them all. <laughs> <laughs> hear them all. Okay. Okay. So in 1971, I joined the Air Force. And I got stationed down at uh, Davis Monson Air Force Base, which is right outside Tucson. And at the time, it was a SAC base, Strategic Air Command. So we had a couple of wings of B-52s on the base, and these are these 52s are on alert, and they're loaded up with nukes. And, of course, their job was to give them the command to fly in and attack uh, Russia. So I'm working, uh, my MOS was uh, law enforcement, and uh, so I'm working out of the security police uh, organization there, and uh, I'm working a midnight shift. They put, I'm new, and they put me with this guy, <clears throat> older uh, Air Force guy. I think he was like a buck sergeant. So... We go to work, and it's like midnight, and we receive a call to uh, 
take some coffee out to the uh, entry control point at the weapons storage area. So we go driving out there with coffee in hand. <clears throat> and to get there, you had to go down this little two-lane road, and which was about a mile long. And on both sides were the, uh, the uh, mothballs for the aircraft. I forgot the exact name, acronym for it. <clears throat> they had hundreds of planes that were in mothballs. And the road itself, um, on both sides were cyclone fence. Is he, are you still there, Dan? I think he disappeared. All right. Let me... Yeah, he did. He just dropped off. Let's uh, bring him back. <clears throat> well, it happens sometimes. We, uh, you know, we were just talking about technology before we started this segment. And uh, I think I know. lost you there. Yeah, we did. We did. Hey, <laughs> we were yeah, just talking about how <laughs> we were just talking about how you That's, know technology uh, <clears throat> kind of messes little, up. It's a little strange. <clears throat> Sorry, I got allergies. Oh, I can totally understand. So let's see, Tom. Do you remember where where he left off? Yeah, you, Dan, yeah. you were just talking about the the buffs or the the B fifty twos that take off. You know, your, what their mission oh. statement is. <laughs> yeah. So you didn't get the part about where we're driving to the the weapon no. storage area. Okay. So I'm I'm a new guy, and they put me with an older guy, and we get a call to get coffee and bring it out to the weapons uh, storage area to the security guys at the front gate there. So to get there, you got to drive down this two lane road, small two lane road, which is about a mile long and on both sides. It's uh, cyclone fencing with Constantina wire and you're like going down this funnel and on both sides of this area are the, uh, all the aircraft and um, mothballs. So we down without incident, get to the uh, entry control point to the weapons storage area. This is where they stored all the nukes. <clears throat> Give them coffee, chat for a minute, turned around, and we were driving back. We get about halfway up this road, mile-long road, and in our headlights, we see this thing sitting out in the middle of the road. My first thoughts was, was that it was a broken down car. And I think I remarked to the, the guy I was with that that's what I thought it was. And he, he affirmed that's what he thought it was. And as we grew closer to this thing, you can tell that it wasn't a car and we didn't know what it was. So we pulled up on it and stopped and got out and, we walk up, and here's an airplane engine sitting out in the middle of the road, one of these, uh, a prop. It used to be a prop engine, minus the blades, and this thing's sitting out in the middle of the road. And I'd say it's probably almost the size of a, a Volkswagen, minus the blades. So, <laughs> and we're looking around. There's no drag marks. The only way to get this thing out into the middle of the road is to airlift it from the other side of the fence over the seven-foot cyclone fence and down on the road. So we call this in, and our uh, flight chief, the boss, comes out, staff sergeant type, and we're looking this thing over, so he calls his boss, and over the course of maybe a half an hour, all these people started arriving. And we were told to get back in our car and stay there, which we did. Next thing we know is that they had gotten the base commander out of bed, and the base commander was out there. <clears throat> so he's looking at this thing, and no one apparently could figure out how it got there. And uh, we're told to go back to operations, and the flight chief would meet us back there, so we did. And he told us basically to shut up about it not to say another word to anybody. So I don't think a Bigfoot lifted it over the fence. How it got there, I have no idea. Some sort of uh, perhaps trickster 
I think uh, throughout history, you know, they spoke of these things called tricksters and <clears throat> these little tricks they would play on humanity, and I think this was one of them. Well, tell me a little bit about the tricksters, because I haven't, I'm not familiar with that uh, terminology. <clears throat> I think most uh, civilizations uh, have oral stories or written stories of tricksters. These are paranormal type beings who enjoy playing tricks on people. And it's in, it's in almost every culture. Okay. Now you also did see, uh, reading your story, I saw some, um, some witness accounts. Apparently there was frequent, um, there was, there was observations of a large hominid right. running around. It was very fast, which <clears throat> which is exactly right. what these things. They move lickety split. Um, you know, I, and I ended up reading that in a blog. Uh, the, I think the statement I made. I think Will put that up. And then somebody made a comment that they were a tech sergeant who was stationed out there right around the same time, and he was in the security police also. And he said he had never heard of anything like this before. And I remember reading this and thinking, you never heard of this before because none of the troops would want to tell you this. <laughs> right. This isn't something you're going to tell a tech sergeant. There's a lot of things. <clears throat> and uh, my next story will kind of affirm the fact that you know, there's things you don't want to say. There's reports you don't want to make. And this was one of them, I think. No one's going to say anything to this guy. Now, what they had back there, and I was told by two different guys, security types, who worked the area, that they had a, a tall, <clears throat> large, <clears throat> excuse me, bipedal entity that they observed running from telephone pole to telephone pole. And they would, uh, the dogs, they had canine. The dogs would alert on it, although the dogs wanted nothing to do with it, and they would have to actually pull the dogs to the entry control point to get them into the area. Mm. So uh, I'm going to stop right there for a second. That's the part that I find interesting. What, how often do security dogs uh, balk at what they're, uh, you know, what they're, what they've been well, trained they to do? <clears throat> And these, are sent these aren't guard dogs, these are sentry dogs. And there's a difference. Sentry dogs are basically killers. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what do they do? This is, what, this is what they do. Once you turn a sentry dog loose on someone, they're used in Vietnam. <clears throat> and I'm sure throughout history, they, you know, they've been used uh, off and on. But the, these were sentry dogs, and they wanted nothing to do with this... Uh, this area there, especially when this thing was observed or was known to be running about. That's one of the things area that I, like. no, I, I apologize. I, I was just making a quick comment. That's one of the things that I always find fascinating. And I'd love to talk to a uh, animal behaviorist. Why, mm -hmm. how is it that a dog, especially a sentry dog, sounds like it's a four legged seek and destroy missile. Yeah. <laughs> Right? How how is it that a dog like that can sense and smell something that's never smelled, probably never had contact before? What is it that you know? It, it's an unanswerable question at this point, but I yeah. just find it interesting. How do they know that this thing is uh, bad news? Well, and those dogs are highly trained too. It's they're not like you know other dogs. They're 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 very disciplined, and you know we've talked. Um, a couple times about there were a couple of canine officers I talked to years ago who were in Texas um, two units you know one one deputy one dog each they were heading to another town uh, for whatever they were doing and one of these creatures come racing out towards the highway parallel of one of the vehicles and the dogs just went crazy and they said typically those dogs yeah. don't react unless they're told to the <clears throat> command to react Well, you know, after boot camp in uh, Texas, they tried to get us into the uh, sentry dog training. They were looking for volunteers. 
and I love dogs, so I thought about doing it, and they gave us demonstrations, and if you went into it, it was, I think, about six weeks, you and your dog, that you trained together, then it was an automatic ticket to Vietnam, and which I had no problem with. The problem I had was is that once you went overseas, you would come back, but your dog wouldn't. So they would, you know, they would euthanize the dog, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do something wow. like that. So, the, yeah. and the purpose was that because of what the dog was trained to do, and they just felt it could not be civilized <laughs> after that. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah, that'd yeah. be a tough one. Yeah. So. All right. So, so the back to these dogs. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah. Go, I apologize. I, I stepped on the conversation. No, I just no, said no. yeah. So back back to the story. So uh, yeah, they would they would alert on this thing, but the, in uh, at least one case, it, the dog had to be dragged into the area, and then it cowered the whole the entire time, which is what they do around Bigfoot, anyways. The majority of them, they get a whiff of a Bigfoot, and your most vicious dog turns into a panty waist. <laughs> so. These things have been around a number of bases, and my next base up, at, uh, I got shipped overseas and came back and got stationed at Luke, which is right outside of uh, about 15 miles west of Phoenix. Tactical Air Command, so they trained uh, pilots from all over the world on the F-4 Phantom. So I got stationed there, and... Uh, it's pretty funny what happened there because I ended up being a uh, desk sergeant uh, at security police operations. And I started receiving calls from civilians downtown Phoenix in the general area there. And these, the civilians would call me to report UFOs. So what would happen is, is that if they called during the day, then the, uh, Base information order would take the call, but after hours, those types of calls would get routed out to the security police desk, and we would have to field those calls, which basically informed the person calling that uh, the Air Force no longer investigated UFOs, Project Blue Book was closed, and uh, we would inform them to call the police department. In the majority of cases, they had already called the police department, and the police department informed them to call us, <laughs> which I found pretty funny because all the books I had read on UFOs growing up, you saw this type of uh, bureaucracy in action. So, so one night, <clears throat> I'm on the desk. It's uh, 1, 2 in the morning. I start getting these calls one after the other from civilians down in the Phoenix area that they're seeing UFOs over this mountain range outside of uh, Luke, which is, I think it was called White Tanks Mountains. So getting call after call. So I'm talking with a bunch of guys there and I find somebody to relieve me on the desk and told these guys, let's, let's go out to the flight line and, you know, eyeball the, the white mountains and the white tanks and see if we can see anything. So we ended up going out to the flight line area. Now this was prior to nine 11. So you didn't have any fencing going around this base. It was just the base, the flight line, and you had open desert. And that was it. So we ended up parking out on the flight line. There was like four or five cars. We were each in a car shut off the engine, shut off the lights, and we're looking up towards the White Tanks Mountains. And the guy in the car to the right of me goes, what in the hell is that? And he pulls on his headlights, and we look out maybe 100 yards out into the desert area near the flight line. And here's this tall, bipedal thing jogging. 
It wasn't in a flat-out run, and it wasn't jogging slow. It was like in a medium run from left to right. So we start our engines up, and uh, we all go tearing out there to where we last saw this thing, and it is gone. And we're like, what the F? There was no place for it to go. There was no hole. There was no, you know, all you have is desert and tumbleweed. And this thing was gone. And we all saw it. So what it was, I have no idea. Um, well, you guys had a clear view. of have incident for you if you wanted. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. But I wanted to jump. I want to get a little more detail if I can. Um, sure. So you saw this thing out in the desert. Yeah. It's running. It's bipedal. Right. And I'm going to make an assumption, but probably larger than an average man, right? Right. Now, it, this wasn't a 9 or 10 footer, but it was large. Okay. And they're kind of bulky, or was it more trim? Yeah, it was only for a second or two. Okay. Uh, I, I, it, what, from what I recall, it wasn't bulky. Okay. And you didn't feel inclined to go chasing it? <laughs> uh, oh, we, we, well, we chased it out to where we had seen it last. And this is wide open desert out there. There's nowhere to hide. Unless perhaps the thing just fell to the ground and flattened itself out. Yeah. There was nowhere to hide. So, you know, I remember reading uh, some books by Jacques Vallée. And in one of the chapters, he uh, describes the Edwards Air Force Base and how the security police out there uh, were having the same problems with these tall, bipedal entities. You know, Dan... So I think they're, uh, for some reason, that they have an interest in uh, military installations. I, I was going to tell you, too, that we have an ongoing situation going in that region. Um, I don't know what's been going on since, geez, I want to say August or September. And, yeah. I mean, it's two different areas, one near Tucson, the other one's west of there. Uh, I take that back east of there, a number of miles over closer to the... New Mexico border, and in both cases, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of tracks, multiple individuals. Uh, every time our guy there goes into the place, it's all fresh, you know, evidence. So, lots and lots of activity. What, in what area region. is this? Well, uh, one of what the area? one of the areas is near Tucson, and the other one is over huh. near. Um, I can't think offhand the name of the little town. It's near the New Mexico Arizona border. Uh, hmm. It's in a region I never really expected to get that kind of uh, material from, but it's just tons and tons of stuff coming in all the time. Yeah. So there's no military installation in this area at all? You know, I'm not sure. I'll have to ask him. Uh, I'm not really that familiar with the area. But uh, I'll send you some of the pictures that we're getting from there, you know, of the tracks. I mean, they're like wow. I said, they're all fresh every time he goes in there. There, there are hundreds of fresh tracks, at least a half a dozen individuals. Wow. It's just, it's a really incredible situation that's going on. Yeah. Well, and he's also uh, picking up not only the big ones, but uh, infants, little ones. Yeah, the tracks they, range, <laughs> tracks range from three inches up to twenty-two or up to twenty inches. Wow, big boy. And yeah, <clears throat> you know, people may say, "Well, gosh, those are just little kids out there," but the resemblance to human footprints was, is very superficial. Uh, they actually, these yeah. things go deep, deep into them, far, far deeper than even a, uh, an adult would well, uh, and, make in that area. And to give you an example, he, uh, I, I was a little curious about that myself because these are in river bottoms, and there's water there and, and lots of greenery. So um, I, guess, I guess to preface that a little bit, there was a rancher in that same area over near the New Mexico Arizona border who'd had a bunch of uh, stuff going on with his cattle. So he put out a game camera by one of his water troughs. 
Now, typically, Sasquatches will avoid those, but that's out in their environment. When it's on uh, a person's property with, you know, other human objects there, it, that's a different, whole different thing. That's, you know, you're not in their backyard, so, you know, and they're keenly aware of things in their environment, but when, you, but when you're in the human's environment, whatever's there is kind of what's there. So, uh, he got a really clear picture of a juvenile sitting on the edge of this water trough with its feet in the water. Um, and then, there, of course, there were tracks all over the place. So when our guy started, and he's a contractor in that region, so that's how he knew these people. Um, he started looking at some of these river bottoms. Now, when you look at the river bottoms and the footprints, you might tell yourself, okay, that's just somebody that walked through the mud. Well, it's, you know, the, the surface is crusted pretty hard, and then these tracks are in a good two-plus inches deep into the material and he's jason weighs around 200 pounds he's a he's a decent sized guy and he shows his footprints on the material and he barely makes a mark so whatever made these footprints all these footprints is extremely heavy yeah <coughs> say this is ross here i wonder if we could go back to this uh engine laying in the road business that uh -huh. that strikes me as um well, beyond odd. Um, yeah. And it had only been minutes since we had gone down the road to make our delivery. That's what I was curious about. And how does that happen? Um, and who does something like this at 1 a.m. in the morning or you know, 12 minutes, whatever time? It was late. Yeah, and those engines are uh, kind of heavy. Oh, yeah. This thing had to be a couple of thousand pounds. Yep. Did this, did this fence, was this just a hurricane fence only, or did it have that uh, circular concertina wire on top? <clears throat> what I recall, now this is 50 years ago, I'm really dating yeah. myself. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, it was, it was round concertina wire. But I yeah. mean, wire or no wire, it was a seven foot tall cyclone fence. <laughs> right, you, you can just and about I, imagine a couple of kids out there huffing that thing over the Right, fence. right. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, there's a couple of kids that did this playing jokes. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, you know, when I worked for Boeing, we had to go in and out of the weapon storage areas, and uh, that's not an easy process. You just don't waltz in there, and so that's why I'm thinking that something had access here that wasn't easily uh, wasn't easily authorized um, so i'm just thinking yeah this and, and why why in hell is it running around a weapon storage area right i mean is this thing after intel what what is it doing well i'm wondering about this tricksters you know tom asked about that and i haven't heard of that exactly but you know i I've, I've heard similar types of uh you know stories but Elaborate on that if you want. Oh, I got it. I got a good one for you. This is the, my last one. We're, I'm at, still at Luke. We had uh, seen this creature out in the uh, desert. A couple of months goes by. I'm sitting on the desk, and like I said, I'm desk sergeant. So I'm sitting on the desk, and we have what's called a, a SAT team, security alert team. These guys, uh, their MOS is security where ours was law enforcement. And these guys, what they do, they have, they'll have a, a mobile unit with three guys aboard, all carrying M-16s. Then they have the stationary guys like out the flight lines, and they're on foot. So these guys would come in every now and then for coffee because we'd always have coffee going in operations there. So they come walking in, three of them, see the guys all the time, and they're milling, I'm looking at them, they're milling around the, the coffee table and they got this, uh, just something really bizarre with the way they're acting and moving facially, the whole thing. Sitting there watching, they, I'm thinking, they look like they've seen a friggin' ghost. So I called one of the guys over. I said, what the hell is wrong with you guys? And he says, he thought for a second, he says, come on outside and I will tell you. So we walked outside, because I don't think we want anybody to hear this. Walked outside, and I'm actually surprised he told me. So he tells me that they were parked out. They were in a Dodge six-pack, 
This is a four-door pickup truck. Yeah. Uh, three in the front, three in the rear. <clears throat> They're parked out at the flight line, end of the flight line, right near the desert, open desert area. Two are in the front, one guy's in the back. Passenger in the front is turned around talking to the guy in the rear, and he sees this thing out of the desert. It's running towards the vehicle on two legs. <clears throat> He's uh, <laughs> looking at this in disbelief. He tells the guy driving to start it up and get the hell out. He's screaming at him. And they said they all turned around, and this thing came running up at, a, at an angle to the truck, jumped over the rear of the bed of the truck, landed on their right, took a few steps, and was gone. So in the meantime, they're tearing out of there. <laughs> he says, and this, this guy's in shock. Actually, all three of them, they were pretty much in shock. So I that's the imagine. story he related to me. Pardon? I say I could imagine. Um, I encountered the uh, security guys one time when I was in the Air Force. And I don't uh -huh. remember what was going on, but they come down the hall. I worked in an in, in a electronics lab. And these guys uh -huh. came down the hall looking for something or doing something. And one of them told me to get up against the wall. And I looked at him. I said, you're kidding. He wasn't. Uh, so, yeah. you know, they're not like they're out just goofing off. Huh. Huh. I wonder what that was all about. I don't know. Uh, whatever they were looking for, they did or didn't find it. And then away they went. And it was just poof and they were gone. Yeah. But the look on his face and the end of that M16 indicated that he meant what he said. Yeah. So it's not yeah, like they trained they, a little bit differently spooked. than we were. Yeah. Pardon? It's not like they're going to be spooked easy, you wouldn't think. <clears throat> oh, these guys were spooked. Yeah. It was evident when they walked into operations, they were spooked. It was just blaring. <laughs> so they said, well, what the hell do you think it was? You know? Yeah. We don't know. Well, are you going to make a report? Hell no. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I've been in the Bigfoot ever since I was a kid. I read all the old you know, books uh, by the, you know, there weren't many then back in the 60s, mid-60s. And, um, well, I'll tell you, you know, I, I mean, like everyone else, I thought Bigfoot was in the Northwest. That was it. Yep. And I'm hearing these stories down here and seeing this stuff, and I'm thinking, this is like Bigfoot, you know, but in the desert? Right. No friggin' way. Well, you know, where I, do these I, things live? Where do they Where do they bed down in the desert? What do they eat? Yeah. You know, I read, you know, the first, first I read of them was in Outdoor Life magazine when I was about 10. I so I figured, okay, they're just critters up in the forest. But the yeah. longer I look into this, I find stories of them being elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking to a sergeant. Every, one day. They're everywhere. Yeah. I was talking to a sergeant. One wonder. Day. He told me that uh, he'd seen one cross the road as he was heading back to back to base from town. One foot on the shoulder, one in the center line, and one back on the shoulder, and it was gone again. This is at night. Yeah. What base uh, was this? Uh, Minot Air Force Base when I was up there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> I always wondered what I did to, you know, whatever. But that's how I ended. But again, when we know, were getting orders, when we were getting orders in Japan and getting ready to come back to the States, we we're all praying to God it wasn't going to be Minot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had one guy who got Minot. The poor guy was crying. Well, you know, it, it was a, a shock. At, at first, uh, yeah. but um, I, I discovered there are things to be seen, you know, so it's it, it's more interesting than a long way from the ocean and the mountains and all that, but still, yeah. got those things up here, uh, 
I was watching a, a news report here. It was in the newspaper. Then it was on a Fargo TV station here several years ago. Uh, a tracker, guys out trapping, came across mm -hmm. prints in the wintertime. And he followed them for seven miles. Up, I think it was a Cheyenne River Valley, maybe. Mm -hmm. So, again, I, I assumed they were out in the Pacific Northwest only. And, well, not so much. Yeah. Yeah, very strange. <clears throat> well, they like the military installations for some reason. So it kind of makes you wonder, uh, what are these things really all about and what are they? Right. Who are they related to, you know? Or who do they work for? Ooh, now that's getting creepy. Of course, they appear They appear physical. They have to eat. They, you got scat. Yep. You got prints. But what really are they? Jacques Vallée, in his books, he came to the conclusion the more he, more he studied uh, UFOs, the more he came to the conclusion that it's all related. That the the area that UFOs and Bigfoot and ghosts all stem from come from one and the same dimension. Or okay, that's, you know, that's something that I've always wondered about that. Um, you know, it seems like the, 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 I mean, I find UFOs fascinating and all that, um, but I can't go to an area, I can't research them, you know, you can't predict where they're going to be, they're just, <clears throat> they're a phenomenon, and, you know, the apparently the DOD has come out within the last couple of years and say that, said they exist, but Bigfoot is a whole different um, kettle of fish, so to speak, I, I mean, I, yeah. Will, Will knows this, there's two areas here in Oregon that I can kind of predict uh, when and where they're going to be I, with, with some regularity, not absolute, but with some regularity, I can go out and, and find these things, um, hear them, uh, have even witnessed them and, and, you know, been bombarded with uh, the horrible smell. But uh, I just, yeah. uh, you know, I guess... I know some people kind of make that connection. I just have a hard time with that. They just seem like they're part of the uh, natural environment. Um, I can't see one of these things sitting in a UFO and flying it. But <laughs> um, Chew yeah, back I don't know. That, that's just my yeah, just, just my thoughts. Yeah, right there. There you go. Well, yeah, he he yeah he does. He's in the he's in the movies. Um, but they're they're a fascinating. Uh, topic and they've been around, you know, gosh, they, of course, they predate not only the settlers coming in, but also the Native Americans said they were here when, when we got here. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, wasn't it back in the 70s that the UFOs shut down, like, all those silos? I haven't heard that one. Oh, yeah. Google it. All right. They, uh, they had one or two hovering over the silos and they shut everything down the power the all the minuteman silos were in operational for i think about an hour well, it had to be the russians yeah there were uh ufos spotted in uh, right above one of the silos sitting there hovering that's a good that's interesting that's about the time that when I was hearing these stories, mid seventies. Yeah, Ross, I'm going to jump in real quick. Um, you had some prints at a, at a uh, secure site, but it's. I mean, anybody can just hop over the fence, right? I mean, it's not that difficult, correct, to just go in there and wander you, around and make some prints. Sure. Yeah. You're you're back onto this uh, uh, tall hurricane fence business, and guess what? There's um, radar or some kind of a security at every location yeah right. i was i was being very very f facetious i know um, you were these things see rate <laughs> rabbits when they go jumping or birds gotcha well they have, they supposedly they have a uh, crew down at edwards air force base whose job it is is to keep these bigfoot off the flight line down there when they have a uh, prominent landing 
or the a landing of something, like when they had the uh, shuttle and they would land there, these guys would go out and ensure that the Bigfoot didn't come out and uh, interrupt the landing. Oh, now that that's their that's job. a great thing to see on TNN. <laughs> Dan, can you give us some extra details on that? I'm, I'm interested. Why? How did they know? What's going on? Well, I mean, I've read this in several uh, places, and I, I, I do know, and I heard word of mouth about Edwards. And, you know, I don't have conclusive proof that, I mean, this is like hearsay, but there are uh, supposedly families of Bigfoot living in that, in that area around Edwards. Okay. Uh, one or two guys down at Edwards who told them, yeah, yeah, we, we got them on tape. We Everybody knows all about them. We're told to leave them alone. And, you know, we make sure when there's a uh, uh, landing of the space shuttle or something else that they don't come out on the runway. <laughs> no, that's interesting. Very well, interesting. they chase them away with. Pardon? What, do you, what did they use to chase them away? Oh, I, I have no idea. <laughs> Okay, I just wondering. I I imagine just driving towards them would would get them out of the area. Okay. So, yeah, I want so to here's back another up for a second. Yeah, you ever been around uh, Edwards? Edwards is pretty desolate out there. I mean, a Bigfoot family. What do they eat? Like Will said, what in the hell could they eat out there? <clears throat> well, there's a lot of sand and dirt. <laughs> hey, let me let me back up for a second. Um, so, what's what's the deal with uh, Minot? Why not Minot? Huh? Reasons a reason? Do you, you mean that we didn't want to get stationed there? Right. Oh, it had a reputation. Oh, the weather cold. So we were in northern Japan where we froze our behinds off, and we didn't want to go to a another frozen area. Yeah. Yeah, it gets cold occasionally. I... <laughs> yeah. you, you know, I, I think all the military branches have their duty stations like that. I know in the Army when I was stationed in Germany, um, you know, two of our favorite places were Wild Flicken and Grafenfeer. So I, I actually caught <laughs> Frostbite and Wild Flicken, so I, I can fully understand. Well, you know, worse than my not was the uh, fear of going to the Aleutians. <laughs> Is that, uh, you didn't want to go to the Illusions. They have a base out there. That would be cold. Uh, yeah. A lot of humidity. Make the really... Yeah. yeah. You know, this might strike you as kind of interesting, but believe it or not, Minot actually had, a, one time, I don't know if they're still out there, but I not Minot, but North Dakota had a uh, Coast Guard station out there. So I thought... Mm -hmm. That must be a real promotion to have been uh, stationed out there. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. Yep. Now, you have to wonder what the Coast Guard is doing in North uh, North Dakota. They were uh, <laughs> operating a uh, an Omega station. There are six of these around the world. They've decommissioned them since. Um, they were navigation. Tom and I drove out there one time. Yeah, we did. In the middle of nowhere. It took hours to get out there. So, uh, Dan, you see what you've been missing out on. <laughs> no, I love the desert. I like the heat. I don't like freezing my behind off. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not that bad. Yeah. This year, anyway. Well, you know, I mean, I was 19 before I saw my first snow. I mean, it looked pretty on TV. That was about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is, yeah. Yeah, Dan, I want to uh, I want to go back for I, I just want to get a little more information on uh, the, uh, for lack of a better word, the Bigfoots that were and this was like a mothball area, correct? Yeah, yeah, there's an acronym for it. I don't remember what it was, but yes, yeah, so they could they'd have like forty five hundred. At least they did forty five hundred or so uh, aircraft and mothballs. Okay, and I think they chose the desert because it's the low humidity, it's dry, you have low corrosion. And, exactly. Yeah, 
<clears throat> good storage for uh, for aviation. So, right. what, was this an ongoing thing? I mean, had this been going on for some time? Where uh, because you know you you get a rotation, right? You you're either your security or whatever your MOS. Um, you know, mandates that you do, you're going to be there for a while. You're going to rotate out. How long did you, did you get any sense that this Bigfoot activity had been seen out there? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, I wasn't given, uh, <clears throat> you know, everybody, like you said, spend a little time there and then they're off to the next base. I have no idea. I would imagine it's been, you know, it wasn't recent. It's probably okay. pretty much ongoing. Well, that's interesting. Well, the reason I asked is uh, I just wondered if uh, this just a kind of a curiosity on my part, if possibly this is an area prior to the establishment of the um, Air Force, you know, acquiring the land and turning it into a, you know, again, mothball is not the right term, but that's kind of the uh, civilian vernacular. Right. But maybe these creatures had historic precedents in the area. Yeah. Uh, and now they've got this, you know, human presence there with technology, and maybe they're just, you know, I don't know what their motivation would be, but it's just interesting. Yeah, I, I yeah. just find no, that I understand fascinating what you're well, you know, <clears throat> that whole Tucson area is a strange area. I mean, the, <clears throat> it goes back 10,000 years. As far as the Bigfoot years, goes? The, yeah, yeah, Bigfoot and what these, uh, what they call, you know, the Indians talk of the little people, who actually, I know somebody who, when I was down there in Tucson, I actually uh, witnessed the little people. So there's a lot of things going on in the desert, the UFOs. <laughs> If you're into this paranormal stuff, uh, you're in heaven down there. <laughs> right? Well, I yeah. think we had a famous radio talk show host that was down there, and uh, he seemed to really enjoy it. Well, listen, I want to thank both of you. Uh, Dan, I really appreciate your coming on and, and sharing uh, this very fascinating story. I can't imagine how. Uh, I think the the engine or the nacelle or whatever it is ended up in the middle of the road in such a short period of time. Ross, yeah. thank you for coming on and interesting stories as well. You bet. Dan, I'm going to send you some of those right. pictures from uh, our guy Jason down there so you can get an idea of what's going on currently. That's great. I would appreciate that. You bet. Thank you. Fellas, we really appreciate Well, thanks for having us on. Oh, our, our pleasure. Really appreciate both of you coming on. And folks, stay tuned for the next segment. Welcome back from the break. We have Norma joining us. Uh, Ross is still on out there in space somewhere. He'll come in uh, when he decides to. Brian hasn't come on yet, so I'm not sure if Brian got sidetracked. But um, So, Tom, do you want to kick things off? Yeah, I'd love to. Great. I'm going to introduce everybody. We've got Norma with us. We have Ross. And we have our favorite questions from, from you guys, our listeners, and we really appreciate that. Um, I've got a question. There. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Bob, Bob is here with me, too. And Bob, we got Bob. How you doing? Hey, how you doing, Tom? Well, I'm doing good. Good to hear from hey, you. Hey, Bob. <laughs> how you doing? Good, good. Glad you joined us. Glad to be here. All right, I'm going to kick it off here. I got a gentleman. Uh, this is from a guy named Chris, and he may be an Oregonian. I'm not sure, but he said... He used to work with a Bigfoot enthusiast um, who worked uh, on the railroad that runs through the Dalles and Hood River. And, Will, you know those areas. Uh, but for our listeners, uh, the Dalles and Hood River is actually in the northern, utmost northern part of Oregon, right on the border with, uh, you know, it's got the uh, Columbia River there. 
And he says he's seen the creatures numerous times on the tracks. So this is sort of a question for Will. Have you heard of the creatures that may run along the rail lines as a means of traveling through an area? He says, I understand the curiosity of a rail, especially with the noise of the engine. Um, but, but he's a little skeptical. He says, I feel it's too open and exposed for them to spend any length of time around. So what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I interviewed a guy years ago who was a railroad worker, and he said that they, they saw these things numerous times along rail lines. It was very common, and I want to say it was in that region. I, I can't remember offhand because it was quite a while ago, but... Um, when you when you look at open it's not just rail lines it's uh you know the areas where high tension lines run through you know those are those are swaths through forests oftentimes that are cleared you know to keep brush off the lines uh in roads and trails things like that you know wildlife will travel when we're talking deer and things like that little path of least resistance so you'll see you'll see a lot of times deer and, and other animals in those kind of places and because they're open they're easy to travel so a predator like the sasquatch isn't necessarily going to be out in that area but they might be along those areas watching for game so oftentimes when they're seen near those places that's what they're doing well that makes a lot of sense and i just want to ask uh, is it for me you know for many of us it's a rhetorical question to you but let's talk about the dows and hood river um, do they have a history of these things? Oh, yeah. Big history in those regions. Okay. And you have mentioned something. We've talked about it on the show in the past, but I'm just going to bring it up again. And I'd ask you this uh, many years ago because I, I just found it astonishing. They actually will swim across the Columbia River. Yes. In fact, there was one point... Uh, there were several places where I had witnesses tell me they'd seen them swimming the river, but there was one area, actually, there's a little town on the Oregon side, little town, we well, can't even call them a town, <laughs> on the Washington side, along Highway 14. Um, the place has one building, uh, and it's a store, and I think there may be a couple other things in that building currently, but uh, between those two points, locals would see them swimming back and forth frequently over the years. Do you know if, uh, are they, is there a certain time of day, would it be in the daytime, broad daylight, evening, night? Do you have well, any thoughts on that? In, those pla- in that particular place, you're not going to see anything at night, obviously, because very low human population, plus nobody's out there looking. Oops, hold on. At that point uh, of the river, in fact, a lot of points along the river, unless it's near where there's uh, any sizable population or people out doing something, and typically there aren't anybody out on the Columbia River in that region doing anything at night, you're not going to see them. So it's primarily been daytime sightings. Didn't we get a uh, somebody who, <clears throat> I'm not going to mention their position, but somebody who's kind of in a position of authority, uh, she had a sighting on the Washington side. Uh, across the river was it anywhere near this area that you're talking about uh you, you know who i'm talking to yes who i'm I do referring know. to i do um okay. where that happened that was north of the town of carson so it wasn't near the river however uh if you go to the columbia river um it'd be upstream from carson near cask uh not cascade locks there's another point up there uh, where they have crossed the river. You know, I, I, I again, I, I find it fascinating. Now, the Columbia has been, it's been tamed, it's been over-tamed, you know, with uh, water control mechanisms for flood control. And then some time ago, part of that was dynamited by the Army Corps of Engineers to allow the river to run free. Uh, I'm just speculating, can you imagine what it was like back in the day before there was any uh, flood or current control on the river and that thing was just a raging uh, I just can't imagine it must have been an extremely powerful creature to be able to cross the river yeah I have no idea what they were doing back in those times uh, right I don't, I don't know of any offhand any old reports from that time period where people saw them swimming or crossing the river but 
you know, the farther upstream you go, I'm sure with lower water levels it would be easier. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. All right, so I'll jump in. Uh, Chris has given us a lot of material, a lot of questions. Uh, he's got another one here, and I'm not sure where we're going to go with this, but I'll just uh, I'll fire it off. Um, have we been approached, or will have you been approached by anyone involved in the alleged, uh, you know, where there's been an accident from a vehicle who's hit one of the creatures along the Columbia River Highway? Um, how is that handled? And um, you know, is it is there any effort to uh, prevent that from being public information? Uh, not that I'm aware of. There have been, you know, them seen along the highways there. You know, Highway 14, and I can't remember which one is on the Oregon side offhand, but um, the parallel river. But now, if you go a little bit farther north, uh, just north of Yakult, in fact, the little little community of Amboy. Uh, I know we talked about Buddy Fight, who was a person that we knew back, you know, in the in the 90s. And uh, a friend of his owned a gas station and garage in the town of Amboy. He had his Jeep out one night. I think there were him and another guy in the Jeep. And it was foggy, and they actually hit one of these things. Knocked it down. It wasn't like Harry and Henderson's. It didn't knock it out. It just got up and took off. Wrecked the Jeep. Uh, of course, you know, what are you going to tell your insurance company? So they just towed it back to his garage and they repaired it themselves. But uh, that's one example. I mean, there have been cases like that, but not a lot of them. Well, that's interesting. I, I've never heard that story before. So they actually hit one of these creatures. Yep. It took off and they everybody went their own separate ways. And yeah, the creature it knocked it down. It got up and ran off, uh, wrecked the Jeep. <laughs> I can, right? can only imagine what what their thoughts were at the time. Well, you know, these things are extremely tough. We've talked about how their bone and muscle density is considerably more than a human. And I go back to, I think the guy's name was Randy up in Canada, mm -hmm. where a moose had <laughs> kicked, it. kicked it. Yeah, and you know, the moose, typically when they kick something, they knock it into the next county or the next state. So they have a, a very powerful kick. It knocked the creature over, um, but apparently it got up. Uh, none worse for the wear, and shortly thereafter dispatched uh, the moose. I, I want to back up just a little bit. Norma and Bob, have you guys, we're talking about these things swimming bodies of water. In that part of the country, have you guys heard of anything like that? Hmm. No, I haven't heard of that. Not really. I know that we have plenty of, in our own research area, we have, um, you know, plenty of waterways that I'm sure that they probably, you know, have crossed at some point or another. There's also um, a pretty huge body of water there that has an island in the middle of it. And it's very possible that they might, you know, be on that island or visit that island at some point or another mm -hmm. but we haven't actually heard of you know anything like that yeah I have, I have plenty of witnesses that have told me uh, you know where they've seen them in water um, so it's it's a very it's very common actually more so than people would think don't uh, chimps in certain uh, prim primates swim they've seen chimps swimming I, I'm not sure about swimming, but certainly in water, yes. Well, in water, yeah. Yeah, in the water. Well, Will, we've, you were telling me uh, there's an account where some guys were in a canoe, I think, at night, and it, or a boat, and it tipped it over. Yeah, actually, that came from our, our good friend T.W. Uh, in New Mexico. There was uh, some, I think they were teenagers out fishing at night in this small lake, and... Uh, I can't remember, there was like, I don't want to say five or six of them in the boat. And this creature actually went out there and turned the boat over. That's what horror stories are made of. <laughs> yeah, that's that wouldn't be a fun experience. No, not, not in my uh, view anyway. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and of course, you know, it's Mexico, so it's not going to be like uh, with their, their famous chupacabra. 
well new new mexico. new mexico but yeah certainly not new mexico, not in that mexico. region it's um geez i want to say it's northeast of albuquerque where this took place oh, i thought you said mexico okay. oh no <laughs> yeah, oh no we've we'll actually had stories that. from mexico yeah well that's interesting uh don't think well, what do you off. do in a situation like that get wet yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you get wet. I mean, maybe for a variety of reasons, whether you're wet in the water or not. <laughs> Hope you're a better swimmer than he is, or she. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. You know, that's a good point because, I mean, you talk about being in the water with Jaws. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I have to this... wonder what what the what the motivation was to go out there and do that in the first place. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sure it was friendly. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to borrow a fishing pole. <laughs> yep. The Sasquatch way of making friends is go out and turn the boat over and throw these guys in the water. <laughs> Midnight snack, maybe. That's right. Don't become the ham sandwich. Stay out of the boat at night. <laughs> or, or the fish. And surf and turf. Oh, that's right. Surf and turf. There we go. Surf and turf, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's hey, you guys' quest or your comments about islands reminded me of something I've wondered to pass. I, I like driving Highway 242 over through uh, the, the lava beds. And you look up there to the north and you can see these little islands of uh, trees in the lava. I've always thought it would be interesting to hike across that lava if you could do so without killing yourself. But I wonder if I might find populations there that I didn't want to run into. Will? Well, it's certainly possible. You know, south of Mount St. Helens, there's an area called the Big Lava Bed. And, yep. uh, you know, going in that area kind of plays havoc with your compass and all that. But um, there are plenty of reports of people seeing him in and around that area. I just wondered about the wisdom of actually hiking over to one of these little islands and then Islands in the lava, I'm referring to. Well, just don't go alone. Yeah, well, yeah, right. And the trouble is, had I had the time, I'd have done that a few years ago when I was uh, on my way over to Bend. So I I inquired of uh, the Forest Service. I, I contacted uh, a geologist uh, a couple of years ago at the Forest Service and was asking about specifically the Oregon lava beds, if he was familiar with it wreaking havoc on your compass um you know because <clears throat> a lot of times it'll bring up minerals and you know iron and that sort of thing will will give errors on your compass but although he didn't know anything about that he did recommend against walking in the lava unless you're on a path because and i hadn't thought of this he says you'll go through a pair of brand new hiking boots in very short order he says it's like walking in um coral it's just very okay uh, cuts up the boots and mm -hmm. i don't know will do you have any have you oh have sure you ever hiked in there uh not too far into it just because you know the navigational problems but um yeah it, he's right you know that, a lot of times that rock is very sharp and it's not a good place to be in i tell you what's really bad uh, i've heard about this i haven't done this but when you trip and fall uh -huh. And now you put your hands down <laughs> to break your fall. Yeah, I have actually done that. <clears throat> yeah, it, it cuts your hands out pretty good. So, uh, Oh, Brian has joined us, everyone. So, uh, Brian, you know, if you have questions, jump right on in there. Oh, he's got his mic muted, so... <laughs> Yeah, when you're out and about, I mean, you really got to watch the terrain you're in because it's not all, you know, sidewalks and pastures and all that kind of fun stuff. It's, uh, you know, you're sort of open to anything. What about the well, Nick, go ahead, Norma. What about the stability as far as, like, you know? That's a good question, too, especially now, I'll tell you, I don't know about other regions, but the Mount St. Helens area, especially the southern region all the way down to the Columbia River, is honeycombed with lava tubes and some of them are really big I, i've been in a few of them some of them are huge uh and they collapse so right. you might you might see this too i've seen them 
the collapsed ones that'll go hundreds of yards and they might be you know 50 or more feet across um, and sometimes you know I've also seen openings where you don't know you're on top of a lava tube and there might be a three foot section of rock that fell you know into the bottom of that and you're talking something is 20 30 feet down and there's no way out of that so if you fell in there you'd be gone and there'd be nobody to find you to get you out of there unless somebody was with you so yeah I, yeah there's I hazards be, out there i think i'd be more concerned about that than the big butt <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely i mean it's a it's a huge concern well yeah. we had a guy on uh will about a year ago uh, he's, he's got a youtube channel very interesting it's called rat and cat and oh, yeah. he had an experience where he was walking uh, correct me on the naming of this forest, but I think it's the Gifford Pinchot. Is that, yeah, did I you pronounce it correctly? The Gifford okay. Pinchot National Forest. Okay, Gifford Pinchot National Forest, and it's uh, pretty similar to the lava beds we have here. And he's just walking along, and all of a sudden the ground just dropped down. Um, I don't know, maybe it may have just been a few inches, but he listened to the rock fall, and he probably did a speed time distance calculation. He, he estimated it was probably somewhere between maybe 40 feet, maybe 80 feet down until right. it hit the bottom. So if this thing had broken open, you're done. And I'll tell you about them lava tubes. They're not like you'll see one. Let's say the collapsed one. It's like a giant trench, you know, for hundreds of yards. It's not a, it's not a one-time thing. I knew an old timer in the area that used to go explore those things, and they'd be multi-layered sometimes. In other words, you've got one lava tube that's near the surface. Then there's another one, or you know, horizontal to it, uh, uh, below that one, and then a third one sometimes, and maybe more. Not to mention, there's um, there's gases too. Yeah, and another concern when you're out and about could be weather conditions. Um, mm. I was in an area uh, near Estacada one year. Unfortunately, I had people with me. I don't go alone. And um, we were up in the snow, and I was down there going to show them uh, an area. And we were hiking up through there, and all of a sudden the snow gave way, and I was up to my armpits, you know, in some kind of an opening. And fortunately, they were there to pull me out of that. But, uh, you know, you could disappear very easily in some of those locations when the circumstances are wrong. Hmm. You know, Will, uh, just, just out of curiosity, how often it does that happen where uh, people might go into certain areas and there could be snow and they're not really expecting that? I think that's, that's what happens with accidents. You know, another example is, um, and I'm trying to think of the location, it's, I, I want to say the Mount Adams area, but I could be wrong might be farther south there, but people will go out in some of those areas. And when it's snowing or, you know, really bad weather conditions like that, and they die out there because they aren't expecting to encounter, you know, adverse conditions. You know, something happens to the car or they get, you know, in a situation where they can't get the car out uh, or out there hiking around. And they just aren't thinking about the possibilities of things that could happen. You know, that happens a lot with, I mean, it's just common sense, I guess. You have to, you know, be aware of your surroundings and what's going on, you know, when you're out there. When we go, it, when we take a group of people with us or do anything as far as research goes, I always tell them, you know, it's, it's not just Bigfoot you have to worry about out there. <laughs> There's a, plenty more that you should be, you know, should be in the forefront of your mind when you're out you know, in the woods doing anything. Absolutely um, correct. And we always take, you know, everybody, we always know where everybody is, you know, two ways, um, because, you know, cell service might not be uh, optimal out there. Uh, everybody, if anybody walks away from, you know, base camp, we have to know where they're going, all that stuff, so. And and oftentimes you got to watch the two ways also. I've had them. Uh, you know, I'd be within eyesight of whoever I'm with, and the two ways quit working. Yeah, they do. That's that's absolutely true. That's why you have to have a backup plan. Exactly. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> hey, I want to jump in for real quick. Uh, Ross, I know you've got some uh, radio and electronic knowledge. 
what are your thoughts on why the, why a two A would suddenly fail, but they're in line of sight? I was just thinking about that when when you asked. Um, typically, that's phasing, which means the uh, signal is going straight across to from person A to person B, but also bouncing off of a whatever. But out in the forest, that's not an issue. Just seriously isn't, you know. And so I'm trying to figure out why that would happen. So at this point, it's um, I'm going to have to puzzle on that a bit. Is it line of sight or is it terrain? It, you know, is something in the way as far as like, um, you know, a rock outcropping? I mean, what would... Well, I'll give Those you. Those things can do it, I'll but give you typically don't. I'll give you a specific example when it happened to us. Uh, my buddy Jack and I were not far from the Clam, uh, the Klamath River in Northern California here, and uh, it was a big open field area. It was flat, just just some trees around. We were out of the trees. We we're in the open, and he was maybe two hundred feet from me, and I called him. You know, we were trying to stay within sight of one another, but I said, "Well." We need the radios, and the radios were new, batteries were fresh, um, but we needed to maintain that communication, you know, in case we lost sight of one another for whatever reason. Uh, and it was an area with a lot of activity with these creatures, so uh, I was very cautious about that at that particular time. And I went to call him to come and look at something, and no answer. And I waved him over, and we, when we approached each other i said hey did you hear me calling he says no i didn't hear anything and we tried the radios again and they worked at close proximity but and, and you know they had a much farther range than that distance so it was kind of a puzzling situation well there's two things i can offer there for an explanation first is they may have a uh, squelch setting that was set a little bit too high and that would be negated if you happen to get further apart and then they worked again and then that situation would be a, a reflection off the ground which sounds like really unlikely except that the um, navigation system for uh, instrument landing systems for aircraft lies on that exactly the the, uh, the glide slope the glide path transmitter at 300 megahertz in that area has a straight line of sight signal and then one that bounces off the ground and those two add and subtract from each other to give the aircraft um, landing guidance that could have done also at 200 feet and that's just a quick speculation on my part what about all the um you know the uh cell phone waves or whatever you want to call it that are bouncing around out there could that do it have anything to do with it no those things are so minuscule as compared to the uh, field strength of a two-way radio mm -hmm. cell phones work because they have such extraordinarily sensitive receivers and to the point where they are very bothersome to um, other licensed services on occasion but they are very very sensitive I don't know how I would describe the um, small amount of signal it takes to make a cell phone work, but it's seriously small. What about frequency separation between the cell phones and the two-way radios? Are they uh, sufficiently, or can they overstep on each other and cause interference? Um, perhaps. And not because of the frequency separation, but just because of um, the frequency separation from cell phone to uh, two-way radio typically is like a long way apart. But uh, if you got a, a not very well-designed receiver, such as in your cheap little two-way radios, it doesn't take much to overcome their sensitivity in the front end of the receiver such that they don't hear anything. There's a possibility that could have been in there, too. But, um. And again, this is just um, kind of tips for people out there that are, uh, you know, just things to keep an eye out for when you're when you're out in the field. Good yeah. idea to have radios. And here's my thoughts on the radios. You know, when it says 
and this thing's good for up to you know, 28 miles. I <clears throat> invariably will move that decimal point over to the left. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> One or two. Isn't, it, isn't that line of sight? I mean, that's like, you know, you're waving to each other 25 or 20 miles away straight on, you know? I, it would be I, line, I, yeah, it'd be line of sight, but even with a uh, directional antenna, then you're, um, then you're doing wishful thinking even at that point. Yeah. <laughs> and these little walkie-talkie antennas are really inefficient and they're omni so that means they radiate in all directions so they're not directional but yeah mm -hmm. it's just it's like the old uh, stereo uh, specs more power per channel there's lots of ways of describing that but it's it's marketing so maybe the best way to avoid all this is just get a satellite phone well no cuz these little phones are if you know what their limitations are and work within that they're fine sat phones are they're a good they're a good uh, resource uh not used them but i've been with uh, guides up on several cascade mountains that those guys use them to good advantage but they're expensive and expensive to use but they're when you need them you need them you know, the prices come down. I remember the days of your, uh, they were like $15 a minute. And I think well, you can get plans now where it's as little as 2 to $5 a minute. Right. Which is still, I don't know, I'm not good at math, but that's pricey to have a chit-chat. <laughs> a chit-chat, but if you need somebody to come get you, it's a cheap that's deal. Right. <laughs> sure is. Okay, we got another question here, and this one is for Will. Uh, it's it's actually I guess we're just going to throw it to, out to everybody. Uh, this person wants to know. This is Chris again. He says, "Have do we have any re, uh, reports of Reedsport, Oregon?" Okay, it's two stories shared with me. Seem to point that there is something in the area along the forest roads. Uh, it's off limits to the community. And a former employee claims uh, that she and a group was with, uh, they'd heard a frightening scream on one of these roads. Uh, they, had, they had to race back to their vehicle. I understand that. Uh, and quickly evacuate the area. They had been making their rounds and stopped for a stretch when the unseen scream scared them all. I can vouch for that. Those unseen screams... Um, are very unexpected and <laughs> they're you know it's something that you've never heard before or it's something that's not normal uh to the to the woods um will what can you say about those sudden unheard screams well that's a definitely an underwear changing moment <laughs> and in that area uh, yeah that area of, of oregon sure there's plenty of them in that region you know that's fairly um low human density you know along the um, western coast there so yeah that's a long history of that region but yeah there you know, is these things will scream and sure you're gonna you're gonna want to head for the hills i mean i've heard him scream from distance and it, it catches your attention i've heard him so, up close and it definitely gets your attention <laughs> that's what i was talking about yeah and I, and I think it caught the attention of all the campers in the area. There was uh, colorful metaphors and oh, comments yeah. going on, I yeah. imagine. <laughs> How about the rest of you? What, do you? what are your thoughts? When the time comes, I'll let you know. <laughs> Norma, you, you've you heard uh, the creatures out in the woods. What, what were your thoughts? Um, <laughs> well... It depended on if they were far away or very close. Um, you know, I'm always fascinated when I hear it. I mean, I, 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 I guess I don't get nervous. I kind of just, you know, listen and, and see if I can pick things out and figure out what it is. Um, but there was one night Bob and I were out uh, before we got our recording uh, uh, mechanism and it was probably about two or three in the morning and all of a sudden we just heard this moan. It was very deep 
kind of sorrowful moan and it happened I think like three times, right? Was it three times, Bob? Yep. And it was so fascinating that I mean I had one of those um like an an iPod, you know, just something that I had in my pocket that I wanted to I wanted to bring it out and record what I was hearing, but I didn't want to move because I didn't want to miss you know, what was going on and I didn't want to uh, interrupt it kind of thing. So I guess I don't, I don't know. I, I just think it's, it's pretty, pretty incredible when I hear, when we hear, you know, things like that out there. You know, no, so it was like a sorrowful moan. Yeah, yeah it was. It was interesting. It was very interesting. And it was very, very close. <laughs> <laughs> it was very close. Um, and this is the and this is in the exact spot where we um, do a lot of our research, and so this has been gosh, gosh, like what ten years ago or more, yeah. ten or more years ago when this happened, and it's still it's still going on. Not the moan thing; we haven't heard that uh, since then. But that was that was pretty cool, and it wasn't you know like a a coyote or anything like that. It was. It, I don't know. I don't even know how to describe yeah, it. Yeah, I think it was right after that we got our listening device yeah. because it was so interesting, but we had no record of it. Now we've got a record of everything. So. Well, you said something interesting. You said it wasn't a coyote. Uh, I'm assuming, you know, a moan. We're, we're talking kind of a lower frequency, right? Coyotes kind of yip, and, and this is a lower frequency sound? Oh, yeah, it was It was deep. It was, um, it kind of, you know, kind of... Uh, I don't know. It, it was went, mournful. Yeah, it was, it was mournful. mournful. It kind of went up, you know, it, it reached a peak and then it went down, but it wasn't like a high, you know, um, octave, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was. It was quite close. Yeah, it was very close and it was, um, I don't know, it was, it was very cool. <laughs> it, was, it was different. And, and we're standing there in the pitch dark and we're just, you know, we have, I mean, we're, there's nothing between us and them or you know us and it and uh we just kind of stood there and waited and and listened and we kind of hoped it had, would do it again but that was it it was like three times and that was it but it was very deep it was very like you know like bob said mournful um like would you guys just go away i'm trying to sleep <laughs> <laughs> you know i don't know we were naive in those days yes. we, did, we didn't move and i don't know what i was thinking you know, Norma, actually, you you just actually kind of answered my question. I was I was just going to ask you and Bob, um, do you think that they were threatening, like the, like the the roar that you heard? Were they trying to like like try to kill you, or they're just trying to kind of scare you away? Uh, you uh, it was neither. Um, it it wasn't threatening. It wasn't you know wanting to get us out of there per se. Um, it was just. just making their Right. Yeah. 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 And it wasn't really even. I don't even. You know, we've had we've had uh, things happen where it was making us or, or making us aware that it was there. You know, this wasn't one of those times. It was. I don't know. It was just. Uh, I don't know. It was just more. It was just mournful. It wasn't. You know, it wasn't in distress. It wasn't. You know, trying to get us out of there. It wasn't threatening. It was just, I don't know. It was, it was different. Announced in their presence, basically, right? <laughs> I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess, but yeah. it didn't do anything after that. It hadn't done any, it didn't do anything before that. It was just that mournful, you know, few times that it did that. And it was, um, and that was it. You know, we didn't even hear really any movement no i was patient there was nothing coming in nothing going out yeah it just all of a sudden it was i mean all of a sudden it was there <laughs> you know we didn't hear anything coming in or like bob said um so i don't know maybe it was laying around somewhere and it's just i don't know I, I can't explain it don't know what its motive was let's put it that way <clears throat> yeah and you didn't have any other experiences, like, right after that or, uh, like, the next day or? 
Oh, we've had plenty of experiences <laughs> after that, but <laughs> not not like immediately after that. Somewhere they definitely let us know that they weren't happy with us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I, and like I said, it was in that same exact spot. I mean, we've had so much happen in this one area that it's it's, you know, I mean, why would we go anywhere else, really? Um, there's other, there are other places in the surrounding area mm -hmm. that we have gone, um, and we've had, you know, activity there as well. Um, but this particular spot, we've had so many things happen. That's where the bluff charge was. That's where the runner was. Uh, that's the where the eye shine was. Yeah. That we're, that's where the yeah. juvenile was. That's where tree breaks were. I mean, it was, all kinds of things were happening there. So. Yeah, it, it is weird that 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 one spot is seems to be like the hot spot for um, for for that. But hey, Will, uh, just just out of curiosity, I mean, have you seen this before? Where there's like one spot that is kind of like the kind of the uh, hot spot, if you will. Um. Well. It wouldn't be in like an ongoing thing for long periods of time, except in rare occasions like we had at Yakult. Uh, and there were places where they would seem to focus on more than other areas, if you know what I mean. But there are places where, you know, typically they'll keep coming back to if they're not disturbed. Right, and a lot of that also d depends on the prey like the feed like uh, the amount of deer that are, are in that area right yeah it'll depend on the food yeah, yeah. well there's plenty of yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of deer there yeah there's there's definitely a lot of food sources there and we've seen bear there so the bears got to eat too so it, yeah it's vegetation it's water sources i'm sure there's fish and maybe other you know, uh, things that they eat out of the water. Um, you know, I was talking about those those wild cucumbers that we were telling you about before. Uh, but they're all over the place there. Um, I'm sure there's tons. Well, there's the fish in the, the reservoir. Right. There's, there's all kinds of things, you yeah. know, that they can eat. There's plenty of um, shelter, you know, if they, if they need to ditch, <laughs> you know. But a hiker comes around or something. And there's moose there too. Yeah, so there's moose. There's, there's, there's got to be enough to keep the yeah the wildlife fed, you know. So there's no lack of you know all the things that they basically need uh, to to survive there. Whether it's a great hunting place for them or not, I don't know. Um, I would assume so. I mean, there's plenty there, so um, it's it's definitely. Um, it's definitely a place that they like. Yeah, I just want to point out, uh, Bob and Norma, so your research area is in Massachusetts, and I think, you know, we've talked to you guys quite a bit about the activity that you've had there. But the point is, not a lot of people would necessarily consider Massachusetts to be a Bigfoot hotspot. So, and it is. So it's a good, just a good indication that if folks are interested in looking in their area and they don't think they're there, you might want to, you know, just check it out. And some of the areas uh, that you don't think are through there, they are there. It's oh, yeah. Kind of one of the things that we've run into, Will, we've talked about that, is um, I'm going to go to where they're not or we're going to go to where they're not and there they are. So. Yeah. So we're, we're pretty close to the Appalachian Trail, Vermont, uh, New York border. This we're on the you know the western side, so yeah. New it's, Hampshire. it's right there in the wooded area. So you're right, Massachusetts doesn't sound. People think of the cities, Worcester, Boston, and but we're we're more bordering all that woodland to to our you know our west and then north. So not to mention, there's a lot of there is a lot of acreage of woods in this state. That's another thing that people don't realize. There's, uh, you know, there's tons of recreational um, forests Trails. around here. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, you, you could get, uh, some of them are really pretty large. And you can get yeah, lost. Yeah, they've had people on for search and rescue. They've, they've had to go and rescue people. So it's well, not. It's, it's beautiful country. 
it, yeah. it, it is. And it's not as, you know, populated as you might think. Yes, you go more east of Massachusetts. You know, it's not so much there as far as woods go, but there is, um, what is it? The, oh, uh, the Bridgewater Triangle. The Bridgewater Triangle. Triangle you know, that. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there have been plenty of, you know, uh, well, Books fill us in on that because I have not heard of the Bridgewater Triangle. What's Ooh. what's what's the story there? It's supposed to be a real hot spot too. I guess Bigfoots, you know, UFOs, all kinds of kind of paranormal stuff going on there. But it's weird because it's if they call it a triangle. Every, I don't know why it always becomes a triangle rather than a circle or something. But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, it's it's over more on the eastern southeastern side of the state, closer to you know Boston in that area. So. It doesn't seem likely to be a hot spot, but it is all swamp, and there's been a lot of books and reports and things of Bigfoot and stuff on it. I know uh, Lauren Coleman, I think, is the one that Lauren maybe. Green. No, it's Coleman. Coleman yes. Yeah, he came up with, I, I think he came up with that term, Bridgewater Triangle. I'm not, I'm not 100%, but I think he's the one that penned that term. But that's in Massachusetts. You know, I talked to Lauren. Uh, we were at um, a little Bigfoot fest of some sort and i said to him why why is it always triangles you know <laughs> it seems like when i mean the bermuda triangle it's always nothing good there you know the, the I, I think triangle. i think that's where they take oh, but, their cue from you know <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah they get three different points and there's your triangle yeah, there i guess is. yeah um even up in the green mountains uh yeah they get the bennington. In Vermont, there's the bennington triangle where there's all kinds of weird things going on there as well it's it's um, you know, uh, uh, apparently vortexes and, you know, people stepping on rocks and disappearing and there's Bigfoot and there's, I don't know, there's all kinds of paranormal crazy stuff. Yeah, we going try on. to avoid the woo-woo yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> we, I'm like, if I know anything, I won't go to the Bridgewater Triangle. Um, I've been up to the Green Mountain one, but I was naive. I didn't know that that was going on in that area. I was there for you know, uh, Bigfoot, we had a little, one of the groups that I was in had a little expedition up there. Um, but, you know, we had no idea that that was going on in that area. Again. So do they, do they, are they getting like vanishings and that sort of thing in that Bridgewater Triangle where people disappear? I, I, I think they, well, there was a quarry there and I know, they were talking about maybe some, you know, a lot of the, the bad guys and thugs get rid of people in the quarry. Well, or, I, you're right, going yeah. exactly where I was going. I, I just wondering yeah. if that could be actually called the uh, Whitey Bulger Triangle, but you know, <laughs> yeah, there, there's some crazy stuff, you know, that goes on in there, and that's one of the places that you know I will avoid. I, I, you know, I don't have any other. I don't have any more time for any other cryptid <laughs> or any other. You know all of this other stuff. I'm I'm more. I guess I'm more realistic. I'm more. Um, you know the physical. So, you know. Norma, Bob that's why I, we like you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Bob and I are basically on the same page as yeah. far as that goes, and you know we're we're more in that kind of realm. We're not in the other, you know, crazy realms. That, Running from Bigfoot just keeps us that's busy. Right. <laughs> We don't need to run from anything else. And let me tell you, you can, that's 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 creepy enough and, you know, get your adrenaline going for sure when we're out there, you know, doing our research. And when something else, <laughs> you know, <laughs> comes up, we're like, yeah, no, we're not doing this. So it, it can get crazy for sure. And you can go into any any possible direction, you know, just with the Bigfoot uh phenomena you know uh, people are uh, you know i'm not going to go there really but there there are so many aspects that that uh broaden that horizon i guess we're more on the physical part of it <laughs> yeah you know norma um this is just uh, something that i think that you 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 pointed out that i think is so true for like all of our listeners that you know you you think that massachusetts is not a big um, you know, hotspot for lack of a better word for, for Bigfoot. But then we also have 
not only people like you that come forward and, and say that, hey, wait a minute, there's a lot of activity going on. And then also we have like people in New Jersey who, you know, they, they cite Pine Barrens. And the only th- mm-hmm. the only reason why I know Pine Barrens is because The Sopranos, <laughs> the great episode from The mm-hmm. Sopranos. But actually, there's a lot of activity going on in Pine Barrens. So the point is that there is a lot of activity going on around the country. I mean, Listen, here, I'm in Florida, and, I mean, I hear stories about the skunk ape and and things like that and things that are going on in in different counties here. So the point is that uh, there is a lot of activity going on, even if we're not in the Pacific Northwest, you know, uh, there's a lot of activity going around, like, all around the country, so... Um, it's it's so great for for you to come on here and and to kind of share your and um, Bob's stories. So just want to say that. <laughs> well, thanks. I mean, hey, Brian. We... <laughs> Brian, I want to ask you real quick. What are uh, some of the stories that you've heard on the skunk ape and and that sort of thing? Have you heard anything recently? And no, you know, no. Fill us in. Well, well, uh, not exactly recently necessarily, but uh, yeah, you you do hear stories all the time. I mean, there was a story uh, j- just uh, about a month or two ago about uh, like this swamp ape creature, um, not necessarily stalking people or, or killing people, but it was sighted um, a couple months ago here in, um, it, actually it was Lake Wales. Um so so, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll talk more about that, and maybe then the, our our next episode. It, it, and and I want to kind of investigate that a little bit more. But kind of interesting though. But yeah, there, there are stories all the time that that keep coming up here in uh, in Florida about the skunk ape, and um, you know they they come up in different like swamps or lakes or rivers or whatever. So. So that'll be interesting. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. <laughs> the other thing about the different areas is it's fascinating that, you know, there are some areas where they're so much more aggressive. I mean, do you, in, in our area, sometimes they're, you know, they definitely let us know, you know, when they don't want us there. Um, but I've heard you know, many stories, especially, I guess, out in the Pacific Northwest where, you know, people are really um, ushered out. You know what I'm saying? They, they're just, they're so much more aggressive. What is your take on that, Will? Why, why in some spots are they so much more aggressive than they are in others? I really think it has to do with the amount of, um, you know, experience they have around humans. It seems like the less experience, the more aggression. Okay. Well, I'm going to jump in. We uh, that's that's a good segue to another question from Chris, and it's kind of a rhetorical question. He actually, um, it's kind of a comment or a statement. Um, he has a family member who went camping in a place that you and I are familiar with, Estacada, Estacada, Oregon, and he had encountered a man on the way out traveling alone. They were all friendly with each other, chatting. And this is a <clears throat> later became a kind of a famous incident. They're still looking for the guy. He just vanished. But um, the question is, are you familiar with Estacada having a historic precedent or history of these creatures? Oh, yeah. Big history in that area. Goes way back. Okay. And what about in relation to not just this one missing person, but have you heard of any other... Uh, negative encounters or possibly uh, missing people that would be associated with these creatures. Well, you know, it's tough to say sometimes because now that's the region where I was talking earlier about, you know, we went out to look at an area. I wanted to show the people I was working with uh, this particular area, and we were up in the snow, and I fell apparently into some kind of a hole and up to my armpits. You know, my arms are out keeping me from falling further into the hole. So, you know, I have to wonder when people vanish if a lot of those kinds of things, more mundane reasons, aren't why they're vanishing. I mean, you could fall into a spot in the rocks like that covered with three feet of snow, 
and you'd never be found. You'd never get out. And who'd be up there to find you? Well, and it's a terrifying thing. It I is. ran in, I I fell into one of those actually in the front yard of my grandparents' house when I was a kid. We had like three or four feet of snow in the front yard. And I <clears throat> it was an instant learning moment that uh, I struggled <laughs> for a long time to get out of there. So if you're in the wilderness, it could be very terrifying. Isn't it funny how they sensationalize <laughs> these simple, natural things that happen and turn it around to always blame Bigfoot? <laughs> well, <laughs> you and, know? and that's my point. It's, it's like, okay, people put a lot of things on the Sasquatch, but I want to know, is there some kind of additional proof that it was a Sasquatch doing it? Were there footprints in the area? Was there some other, you know, connecting evidence that's, that solidly places this on them instead of just something mundane? Exactly. And I'm sure you've heard about the 411, um, uh, David Pilates and one missing and all of that, all of that stuff. Um, you know, a lot of people, the first thing they think is, okay, there's a Bigfoot. You know, Bigfoot grabbed them. Bigfoot did this. You know, Bigfoot undressed them. <laughs> you know, because they're all finding clothes and shoes and whatever. Um, but, you know, it's not always, obviously, it's probably one of the things that maybe might come 10th on the list. <laughs> yeah, there's there's plenty of other reasons it could be. I mean, you know, and number one, I, as far as I know, he doesn't actually say it's Bigfoot doing it. You know, people... No, he doesn't people place that on the situation and it's not the case secondly yep. when you look at sasquatch hands for one thing you know they're they're too big and and there there was speculation by scientists years ago you know Kranz and a few others that they didn't have an opposable thumb when you think about a hand like ours and, and other primates it doesn't mean they're all going to work the same way. And the reason being is that our hand and thumb, or fingers and thumb, and that, how that works, you know, being opposable, and then the way we use it is a specialized trait in humans. It's not common among all primates. Now, while they can use their hands and fingers in conjunction with one another, uh, it's a highly specialized thing in humans. In other words, you can have the mechanics, but unless you have the software that goes with that to run the mechanics, it doesn't work the same way. So the combination of that dexterity and then the sheer size, you know, they're not going to be manipulating buttons and things like that. Um, it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't click. So I, I really yeah. don't believe it's Sasquatches in those cases. Right. And he does say that he definitely, you know, he, he doesn't pin any particular one thing on you know these missing uh correct you know people yeah so people uh, are jumping to conclusions when they make those assertions right it's it they're fantasizing these these you know incidences that happen they are. where it's just simple things like when you fell you know up to your armpits in snow we had a guy come out i mean it's not quite the same but we had a guy come out in in our research area up the mountain a little bit high a little bit further um, there's a, uh, like a creek bed kind of a, an area that's really, you know, muddy and soggy and, uh, like a bog. Yeah, it is like a bog. Um, and, and it's, I mean, you go in there and you sink down to your knees, you know, uh, and we told him not to go out there. I was going out there to check for foot, footprints that we had seen before. I was much lighter, uh, weight than he was. I knew how to get out there by stepping on logs and foliage and things like that so I wouldn't sink in the mud. And we, again, specifically told him not to go out there. To, don't follow me. Stay on the trail, you know, with Bob and whatever. So I can just go out and check. And he goes out. He followed me. I don't even, you know, against what we told him not to do. And he ended up getting stuck, again, up to his knee in this mud and Bob had to come out and pull him out of the mud and his, go get his, shoes after. his socks and shoes came out, you know, came off him when Bob was pulling him out. Now, how long would he have been there? 
how much more would he have gotten stuck? We're out in the middle of basically nowhere, and unless there's a hiker going out there and and you know finding you, he'd have been out there for a while. Nobody's sure. going to hear him. And what if that was a <laughs> deeper pool of mud? You know, say you know eight, ten feet deep. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. The more movement that you make, the deeper you go. It's like quicksand. Yeah, exactly. So, so I mean, like I said, you know, there's so many things we we know you know, you know, there's so many things out there that uh, can trip you up, so to speak. <laughs> no, you're correct. Absolutely. Yeah, many, many things. I, and things you would never occur to you that could happen. Exactly. And there's plenty of dangers out there, you know, in these mountains and these, these um, you know, uh, places that people go, cliffs and you know, narrow pathways. And I mean, there's all kinds of things. It's a foliage and nature takes care of things that are out there for a while that you can't, you can't even find, you know, uh, a deer dies in the, in the forest and you, you don't even see a week later, there's no evidence of it, you know? So it's, I'm sure that happens the same thing with people and eventually maybe they'll find them and maybe they won't. Yeah, yeah, well, and, and I mean, like Norma's saying, I mean, I mean, you could get attacked by a coyote or a, a, like a like a black bear, and you just never know what is out there. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, that's why I always stress, don't go alone, and you have to be very cautious, you know, don't take things for granted when you're out in the forest. Something as simple as getting bit by something, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, could put you in, in into an anaphylactic shock. There's, you know, it's it's endless, I guess. <laughs> it really is. Well, listen, we're running short in time, everyone. Do we have any more questions or uh, things we'd like to bring up? Well, you, um, in the beginning, backing up, we were talking about railroad tracks and sightings. Did you find, I'm trying to remember... Do you find entrails, your first, one of your first sightings, were they by railroad tracks? Yeah, they were lying in between the rails. As a matter of fact, we were using the tracks as a conduit to get to my friend John's house, and that's where we found those, right on the on the rail line. Yeah, when we were talking about that, that kind of came to mind. I thought you did. Yeah, and the footprints were just adjacent to the tracks. Right. There's a pretty famous one in Whitehall, New York, too, a sighting on a rail line, so... And I don't, um, at Whitehall, New York, where the Bear Road incident, that's pretty popular hot spot, too. Yeah, it's, it's not uncommon. Yep. Yeah, I, I thought that that was possible where you had your first uh, encounter. Hey, well, I, I have a question real quick. Um, when people see these creatures, do, for the most part, do they have, like, objects in their hands, like, in other words, like whether we're talking not 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 necessarily like a like a pistol, but um, just objects in their hands, and they just maybe don't throw the objects, or um, I mean, like what what what's the the history about that? Typically, not. Uh, sometimes there are you know sticks, rocks, people, um, and I say people because I had a interview a lady and her father. Uh, years back who um, her father was the one who had the encounter there was just briefly the the lady lived alone she was um, uh, um, vanished one time and this gentleman actually came around this was in 1949 and witnessed uh, the creature had this lady and he recognized her by her long gray hair it was hanging over her arm and she vanished she was gone after that nobody knew whatever happened to her so, but most times, uh, it's not, there's nothing seen in terms okay, of them okay. carrying, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. I was just, just curious. <laughs> well, we're out of time, everyone. Uh, great panel. Great questions. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Lots of fun. Enjoy Thanks it. for having us. And Bob and Norma, we got to have you back again, of course. You know, keep us updated as to what's going on. Ross, you too. 
Well, they finally lifted our, our we had a curfew. curfew here. We couldn't go much, so hopefully we can get out there again. Oh, very good. Very good. We're a little worried about it. Well, <laughs> They've yeah. got plenty of time with nobody out there. Right. <laughs> oh, it should be interesting. It should be, <laughs> yes. All right, everyone. Stay tuned for the last segment. <laughs> The Spokane Indians, 1975. Indians had a Sasquatch too. Those who think the stories about a huge, hairy mystery giant called a Sasquatch are of a recent origin should talk with the Wenatchee Valley College historian, John Brown. Brown has found evidence that the search for such a legendary creature was underway in the Northwest by the time the earliest white men arrived in the region. While researching material for a book he co-authored with Dr. Robert Ruby, The Spokane Indians, Children of the Sun, he came across a passage that must relate to what is now called a Sasquatch. The reference was in a letter written by the Reverend Elkanah Walker from Fort Colville in 1840. With his wife, Mary, Elkanah Walker was a missionary to the Spokanes. In a letter to the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, he wrote, I suppose you will beat with me if I trouble you with a little of their, the Spokane Indians, superstition, which has recently come to my knowledge. They believe in the existence of a race of giants, which inhabit a certain mountain off to the west of us. This mountain is covered with perpetual snow. They inhabit its top. They may be classed with Goldsmith's nocturnal class, as they cannot see in the daytime. They hunt and do all their work in the night. They are men-stealers. They come to the people's lodges in the night when the people are asleep and put them under their skins and take them to their place of abode without their even waking. When they awake in the morning, they are wholly lost, not knowing in what direction their home is. The account the Indians give of these giants will in some measure correspond with the Bible account of such a race of beings. They say their track is about a foot and a half long. They will carry two or three beams upon their back at once. They frequently come in the night, steal their salmon from the nets, and eat them raw. If the people are away, they always know when they are coming very near by their strong smell, which is most intolerable. It is not uncommon for them to come in the night and give three whistles. Then the stones will begin to hit the houses. The people are troubled with their nocturnal visits. Brown says he has known about many Spokane Indian legends about monsters, but they have been of the Paul Bunyan type that carves out valleys, etc., the ogre referred to in the letter is not really a monster, just a little bigger than man, and he had no idea what mountain to the west is referred to, the one that always is snow-topped. Perhaps it was Mount Rainier. The Spokanes also believed in a race of little people, Brown says. Even if the stories about the little people and the giants aren't true, the Indians believed they were, he says. Many people today believe just as fervently in the existence of a hairy, man-like object that sometimes is glimpsed, but never really seen. Plaster casts of prints supposedly from the feet of such a creature have been exhibited. One Sasquatch hunter has what he believes to be a picture of the man-animal. This area's involvement with the legend goes back some 25 or 30 years to the wild man of Lichenwasser, supposedly seen on that mountain by fishermen. Myth or fact, no one knows. But at any rate, John Brown's research indicates that reports of such a Bigfoot are nothing new. September 22, 1975, Wenatchee, Washington. Tolawa Indian Stories, Del Norte County, California, 1800s. The Tolawa Indians inhabited the far northwestern parts of northern California, just below what is now the Oregon border. For more on the Talawa, here is a good page. Catherine's Recollections Anne and Red Cody recently met and interviewed a woman named Catherine, 
who was of Tolua Indian heritage. Her mother was Tolua, father an Irish immigrant logger. She is now 72 and recalls many legends about Bigfoot, though in no particular order. The following are her recollections about the story she heard growing up in Northern California. I remember my grandfather telling stories of a large, hair-covered man-creature. As a young boy, he was hunting and felt like he was not alone. He sat still near a bush and waited to see who might be following him. Not thirty feet away was a tall, muscular, hair-covered creature standing behind a tree. He watched it for a few minutes until it turned and walked away up the hill. He told his father about this, and his father said that they were a quiet people who shared the bounty of the forests and rivers with the Indians. Many had seen, but it was considered evil to kill one, as they had never harmed the Indians. In the evenings, they could be heard screaming in the woods, communicating with each other. My brother, Joe, ten years my junior, saw what appeared to be a mother with a youngster in tow. The infant was playing with a stick near the creek, while the mother stood stock still and watched. When she noticed my brother across the creek, she grabbed the young one by the shoulder, pulled him in front of her, and she herded him into the trees. She looked back a few times to see if Joe was following. He was amazed at how quiet and stealthy they were. The mother was dark and uniform in color, while the young one was more mottled, with lighter fur on the torso and shoulders. Her grandfather told this story, and she would put the year in the 1880s. In the morning, our parents gathered all the family to clean and fillet salmon from the catch. We would prepare the fish for smoking. We left the entrails for the animals and birds to eat. After a day of work, we packed up the fillets and started on the walk back to the fire area. I left my knife on the bank and returned to fetch it. As I approached the cleaning area, I saw the big, hairy man squatting down and eating the fish entrails. When he saw me, he stood and roared, perhaps to scare me. He did not want to share his meal. I ran back and told my mother, and she said I should never venture out alone. We returned in an hour, and the huge pile of entrails was gone. There were more entrails left there than a bunch of raccoons or other scavengers could have taken that fast. Again from Grandfather. We would see him once in a while mostly in the evenings just after the sun would go down, sometimes in the very early morning. They knew we were there, but would not harm us. They would go out in darkness so they would not have to be seen by people. They would sometimes come near the fire at night, but stay just out of sight. Your nose would tell you they were near, as they smelled like rotted meat. My father once saw two big creatures standing on opposite sides of a small clearing, yelling and throwing sticks. He thinks they were fighting for the space, or perhaps for food. He saw them many times, but was never afraid. They would sometimes take his food at night, but they would never hurt people. When my brother was a baby, our mother left him in a hammock when she went for water. She came back and a creature was very near him, smelling him, but it did not touch him. It knew it was a harmless baby, but was just curious. It frightened our mother, but the creature went up the hill when she approached. If Red finds the rest of his notes, I'll send them along. Best wishes, Anne Rowling's Cody. Welcome. The story is being brought to you by William Jevening and is being narrated by Jim Sower. This is the Ruby Creek story. Stories about the Sasquatch have been appearing in print from time to time since the 1860s and I have clippings in my files from almost every year since the early 1920s. But the modern history of the Sasquatch really dates from September 1941, when one of these creatures paid a visit, in broad daylight, to an Indian family named Chapman. While the Amerindian stories have usually been dismissed as legend, or laughed off because uh, they're not supposed to be reliable, this experience was accompanied by too much physical evidence to be ignored. The Chapman family consisted of George and Jeannie Chapman, and children numbering, at my visit, four. 
Mr. Chapman worked on the railroad and was living at that time in a small place called Ruby Creek, 30 miles up the Fraser River from Agassiz, British Columbia, in Canada's great western province. It was about three in the afternoon of a sunny, cloudless day when Jeanie Chapman's eldest son, then age nine, came running to the house saying that there was a cow coming down out of the woods at the foot of the nearby mountain. The other kids, a boy age seven and a little girl of five, were still playing in a field behind the house bordering on the rail track. Miss Chapman went out to look. Since the boy seemed oddly disturbed, and they saw what at first she thought was a very big bear moving about among the bushes bordering on the field beyond the railway tracks, she called the two children, who came running immediately. Then the creature moved onto the tracks, and she saw, to her horror, that it was a gigantic man covered with hair, not fur. The hair seemed to be about four inches long all over, and of a pale yellow-brown color. To pin down this color, Mrs. Chapman pointed out to me a sheet of lightly varnished plywood in the room where we were sitting. This was of a brown okra color. This creature advanced directly towards the house, and Mrs. Chapman had, as she put it, much too much time to look at it, because she stood her ground outside while the eldest boy, on her instructions, got a blanket from the house and rounded up the other children. The kids were in a near panic, she told us, and it took two or three minutes to get the blanket, during which time the creature had reached the near corner of the field only about one hundred feet away from her. Mrs. Chapman then spread the blanket and, holding it aloft so the kids could not see the creature, or it them, she backed off at the double to the old field and down onto the river beach out of sight, and then ran with the kids downstream to the village. I asked her a leading question about the blanket. Had her purpose in using it been to prevent her kids seeing the creature, in accordance with an alleged Amerindian belief that to do so brings bad luck and often death? Her reply was both prompt and surprising. She said that, Although she had heard white men tell of that belief, she had not heard it from her parents or any other of her people whose advice regarding the so-called Sasquatch had been simply not to go further than certain points up certain valleys, to run if she saw one, and not to struggle if one caught her as it might squeeze her to death by mistake. No, she said. I used the blanket because I thought it was after one of the kids, and so might go into the house to look for them instead of following me. This seems to have been sound logic, as the creature did go into the house, and also rummaged through an old outhouse pretty thoroughly, hauling from it a fifty-five-gallon barrel of salt fish, breaking this open and scattering its contents about outside. The irony of it is that all three children did die within three years, the two boys by drowning and the little girl on a sick bed. And just after I interviewed the Chapmans, they also were drowned in the Fraser River when a rowboat capsized. Mrs. Chapman told me that the creature was about seven and a half feet tall. She could estimate its height by the various fence and line posts standing about the field. It had a rather small head and a very short, thick neck. In fact, really, no neck at all, a point that was emphasized by William Rowe and by all others who claimed to have seen one of these creatures. Its body was entirely human in shape, except that it was immensely thick through its chest and its arms were exceptionally long. She did not see the feet, which were in the grass. Its shoulders were very wide, and it had no breasts, from which Mrs. Chapman assumed it was a male, though she did not see any male genitalia due to the long hair covering its groin. She was most definite on one point. The naked parts of its face and its hands were much darker than its hair, and appeared to be almost black. George Chapman 
returned home from his work on the railroad that day shortly before six in the evening, and by a route that bypassed the village, so that he saw no one to tell him what had happened. When he reached his house, he immediately saw the woodshed door battered in, and spotted enormous humanoid footprints all over the place. Greatly alarmed, for he, like all of his people, had heard since childhood about the big wild men of the mountains, though he did not hear the word Sasquatch till after this incident. He called for his family, and then dashed through the house. Then he spotted the foot tracks of his wife and kids going off toward the river. He followed these until he picked them up on the sand beside the river and saw them going off downstream without any giant ones following. Somewhat relieved, he was retracing his steps when he stumbled across the giant's foot tracks on the river bank farther upstream. These had come down out of the potato patch, which lay between the house and the river, had milled about by the river, and then gone back through the old field toward the foot of the mountains, where they disappeared in the heavy growth. Returning to the house, relieved to know that the tracks of all four of his children and family had gone off downstream to the village, George Chapman went to examine the woodshed. In our interview after eighteen years, he still expressed voluble astonishment that any living thing, even a seven-foot-six-inch man with the barrel chest, could lift a fifty-five-gallon tub of fish and break it open without using a tool. He confirmed the creature's height after finding a number of long brown hairs stuck in the slabwood lintel of the doorway above the level of his head. George Chapman then went off to the village to look for his family, and found them in a state of calm collapse. He gathered them up, and invited his father-in-law and two others to return with him for protection of his family when he was away at work. The foot tracks returned every night for a week, and on two occasions the dogs that the Chapmans had taken with them set up the most awful racket at exactly two o'clock in the morning. The Sasquatch did not, however, molest them or apparently touch either the house or the woodshed. But the whole business was too unnerving, and the family finally moved out. They never went back. After a long chat about this and other matters, Mrs. Chapman suddenly told us something very significant just as we were leaving. She said, It made an awful funny noise. I asked her if she could imitate this noise for me, but it was her husband who did so, saying that he had heard it at night twice during the week after the first incident. He then proceeded to utter exactly the same strange, gurgling whistle that the men in California, who said they had heard a Bigfoot call, had given us. This is a sound I cannot reproduce in print, but I can assure you that it is unlike anything I have ever heard given by man or beast anywhere in the world. To me this information is of greatest significance. That an Amerindian couple in British Columbia should give out with exactly the same strange sound in connection with the Sasquatch that two highly educated white men did over 600 miles south in connection with California's Bigfoot is incredible. If this is all hoax, or a publicity stunt, or a mass hallucination, as some people have claimed, how does it happen that this noise, which defies description, always sounds the same no matter who has tried to reproduce it for me? These were probably the last words on the Sasquatch that the Chapmans uttered, and I absolutely refused to listen to anybody who might say that they were lying. Admittedly, Honest men are such a rarity as possibly to be non-existent. But I have met a few who could qualify, and I put the Chapmans near the head of that list. This story was written by Ivan T. Sanderson in True Magazine, March 1960. This concludes the reading of Ruby Creek. Thank you for listening. Welcome. This is a series of six stories being brought to you by William Jevning and being narrated by me, Jim Sower. Story number one. Ape-like monsters. 
Sightings of monstrous ape-like creatures lurking in the darkness of forests and mountainous regions of the world have been reported since the Middle Ages. In 840 A.D., Agobard, the Archbishop of Lyons, told of three such demons, giant people of the forest and mountains, who were stoned to death after being displayed in chains for several days. In his chronicles, Abbot Ralph of Coggeshell Abbey, Essex, England, wrote of a strange monster whose charred body had been found after a lightning storm on the night of St. John the Baptist in June 1205. He stated that a terrible stench came from the beast with monstrous limbs. Villagers of the Caucasus Mountains have legends of an ape-like wild man going back for centuries. The same may be said of the Tibetans living on the slopes of Mount Everest and the Native American tribes inhabiting the northwestern United States. The Gilyaks, a remote tribe of Siberian native people, claim that there are animals inhabiting the frozen forests of Siberia that have human feelings and travel in family units. Based on the eyewitness descriptions of hundreds of reliable individuals around the world who have encountered these creatures, it would seem that the creatures are more human-like than ape-like or bear-like. For one thing, these giants are repeatedly said by witnesses to have breasts and buttocks. Neither apes nor bears have buttocks, nor do they leave flat-footed human-like footprints. In 1920, the term abominable snowman was coined through a mistranslation of the Tibetan word for the mysterious ape-like monster Yeti, wild man of the snow. For the next two decades, reports of the creature were common in the Himalayan mountain range, but it was not until the close of World War II, 1939-45, that world attention became focused on the unexplained, human-like bare footprints that were being found at great heights and freezing temperatures. The Himalayan activity reached a kind of climax in 1960 when Sir Edmund Hillary, conqueror of Mount Everest, led an expedition in search of the elusive Yeti and returned with nothing shown for his efforts but a fur hat that had been fashioned in imitation of the snowman's scalp. The human-like creature, whether sighted in the more remote, wooded, or mountainous regions of North America, South America, Russia, China, Australia, or Africa, is believed by some anthropologists to be a two-footed mammal that constitutes a kind of missing link between humankind and the great apes, for its appearance is more primitive than that of Neanderthal. The descriptions given by witnesses around the world are amazingly similar. Height, 6 to 9 feet. Weight, 400 to 1,000 pounds. Eyes black. Dark fur or body hair from 1 to 4 inches in length is said to cover the creature's entire body, with the exception of the palms of its hands, the soles of its feet, and its upper facial area, nose, and eyelids. Some question the existence of giant ape-like creatures because there is so little physical evidence besides casts of huge human-like footprints. Some researchers respond by pointing out that Mother Nature keeps a clean house. Scavengers soon eat the carcasses of the largest forest creatures, and the bones are scattered. Zoologist Ivan T. Sanderson suggested that if these beings are members of a subhuman race, they may gather up their dead for burial in special caves. Dr. Jean Marie Theresa Kaufman agreed that the creatures might bury their dead in secret places. It may be, she theorized, that they may throw the corpses of the deceased into the rushing waters of the mountain rivers or into the abysses of rocky caverns. Others remind the skeptical that it is not unusual for certain of the higher animals to hide the bodies of their dead. Accounts of the legendary elephant's graveyard are well known, and in Ceylon the phrase, to find a dead monkey, is used to indicate an impossible task. Proving the existence of such creatures may seem to many scientists to be an impossible task, but persistent searchers 
for undeniable evidence of the ape-like beings, feel that proof is right around the next corner in some darkened forest. Delving Deeper Reports of a large ape-like creature in the United States and the Canadian provinces are to be found in the oral traditions of native tribes, the journals of early settlers, and accounts in regional frontier newspapers, but wide public attention was not called to the mysterious beast until the late 1950s, when road-building crews in the unmapped wilderness of the Bluff Creek area north of Eureka, California, began to report a large number of sightings of North America's own abominable snowman. Once stories of giant human-like monsters tossing around construction crews' small machinery and oil drums began hitting the wire services, hunters, hikers, and campers came forward with a seemingly endless number of stories about the shrill, squealing, seven-foot forest giant that they had for years been calling by such names as Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Wok Wok, Oma, or Saskahavis. In North America, the greatest number of sightings of Bigfoot have come from the Fraser River Valley, the Strait of Georgia, and Vancouver Island, British Columbia, the Ape Canyon region near Mount St. Helens in southwest Washington, the Three Sisters Wilderness west of Bend, Oregon, and the area around the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation, especially at the Bluff Creek watershed northeast of Eureka, California. In recent years, extremely convincing sightings of Bigfoot-type creatures have also been made in areas of New York, New Jersey, Minnesota, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Florida. Reports of Bigfoot-type creatures of California go back to at least the 1840s, when miners reported encountering giant two-legged beast-like monsters during the gold rush days. Sightings of the Oma, as the native tribes called them, continued sporadically until August 1958, when a construction crew was building a road through the rugged wilderness near Bluff Creek, Humboldt County, and discovered giant human-like footprints in the ground around their equipment. For several mornings running, the men discovered that something had been disturbing their small equipment during the night. In one instance, an 800-pound tire and wheel from an earth-moving machine had been picked up and carried several yards across the compound. In another, a 300-pound drum of oil had been stolen from the camp, carried up a rocky mountain slope, and tossed into a deep canyon. And in each instance, only massive 16-inch footprints with a 50 to 60-inch stride offered any clue as to the vandal's identity. When media accounts of the huge footprints were released, people from the area began to step forward to exhibit their own plaster casts of massive, mysterious footprints and to relate their own frightening encounters with hairy giants, stories that they had repressed for decades for fear of being ridiculed. Not to be outdone, Canadians began telling of their own startling accounts with Sasquatch, a tribal name for Bigfoot, that had been circulating in the accounts of trappers, lumberjacks, and settlers in the Northwest Territories since the 1850s. Long before the frontier folk discovered the giant of the woods, the Sasquatch had become an integral element in many of the myths and legends of the native people. Copyright, The Gale Group, Inc. This article from Keep Media carried no author, citation, or date. This is the end of story number one. Story number two. Bigfoot hunter trusts his nose to find creature. Big Cypress Bayou near Jefferson, Texas. The motor sputtered, then died, and as the canoe drifted deeper into the swamp, gray tangles of bearded Spanish moss gave way to murky water and black cypress. Knuckles whitened, as Charles DeVore ripped the pull cord, his two-man canoe, three decades old and uneasy under the weight of three men, teetered dangerously with every tug. DeVore yanked the cord once more, then gave up. We'll just have to paddle, he said. There wasn't time to fix the propeller, and there wasn't time for precaution. The party pressed further into the swamp, because 
that's where Bigfoot was. Bigfoot or Sasquatch, that elusive creature more often associated with the Pacific Northwest, lives among these knobby trees of the Big Cypress Bayou, DeVore will tell you. While other people have seen the creature, DeVore, well, he has smelled it. Of course, it's the most indescribably putrid, gosh-awful stench you can imagine. It's overpowering, DeVore said. DeVore has discussed that stench with dozens of East Texans who have reported brushes with the hairy hominid. He investigates sightings for the Texas Bigfoot Research Center, a Dallas-based group that documents close encounters throughout the state, most of them in the piney woods and big thicket. Although DeVore professes to be an amateur, he knows enough to understand the creature's ways. Bigfoot no longer scares me, said DeVore, of medium height and a bit paunchy at sixty-four. It might if uh, one was standing right over me, but they've never hurt anybody. I have a fear of wild hogs, wild dogs, and anything else out there that might bite my butt. But I really have no fear of Bigfoot. So DeVore paddles the bayou in the middle of the night, a coon hunting spotlight, and night vision camera at his side. He also wanders the forest trails he is bush hogged near his trailer house. He sniffs the night air and listens for snapped twigs. It's a hobby, he said, a passionate interest. Devore moved to the big cypress bayou, the slow moving body of water that slinks between Lake of the Pines and Cattle Lake in nineteen ninety. A heart attack had forced him into early retirement. He told himself, I'm going to sit up here beside this water until the day I die and enjoy it. And that's just what he did, puttering around in his canoe with the little outboard motor that he had rigged to the back, or gliding across the deep green water in his kayak, exploring inlets and taking photographs. It's so beautiful out here, he said. Normally I'm not talking, and I sneak up on all kinds of wildlife as he paddled deeper into the forest of submerged cypress trees, stained black by years of up-and-down water levels. Thoughts returned to the rickety little canoe, then to the cold black water, and always to the possibility of sneaking up on the most elusive creature of them all. THE WAYS OF BIGFOOT Although Bigfoot is reportedly huge, seven or eight feet tall, and more than 500 pounds, he is awfully hard to find. That's because he hates being around humans, believers say. When people such as Devorah go tromping into the woods, Bigfoot runs the other way. He lives in uninhabitable areas, especially around Sabine and Sulphur Rivers, the Big and Little Cypress Bayous, and Caddo Lake, where he is affectionately known as the Caddo Critter. We have more swampy areas in East Texas where humans do not live, DeVore said. There's more sightings during the deer season than any other time because people are in the woods. With the advent of ATVs, outdoor enthusiasts can go farther into Bigfoot territory than ever before. In the past decade alone, the Texas Bigfoot Research Center has investigated five sightings in Harrison County, four in Panola County, and three in Russ County. Many of them involved hunters. One Longview man said that he tried to shoot the creature with his twenty-two. It let out a terrifying scream roar, and the squirrel hunter was so frightened he nearly wet himself, he reported. The Longview man's description of Bigfoot reflects many others in East Texas. Long brownish or black hair, the deathly scream roar or scream growl, and that stench which DeVore believes Bigfoot excretes, possibly from his armpits, when he feels threatened. Crystal Steiniger of Harleton says that she has experienced the smell and heard the screams. Steiniger and her colleagues with the East Texas Bigfoot Independent Study get together once a month to look for tracks and hair samples and record Bigfoot's noises on all-night camping trips. They used to attract the creature with Bigfoot calls, but they soon abandoned the calling devices because they made it too aggressive. 
If they're walking by us, we want to hear their normal, non-threatening type of vocalizations, she said, adding later, I've heard solid screams. I've heard grunts, kind of a grunt growl when you get a little too close. That was one of the best recordings. Of course, we got in our vehicle real quick. We didn't leave, but we got in our vehicle. The researchers have posted many of the recordings on their website, www.easttexasbigfoot.com. With so many reported encounters, skeptics quickly ask for conclusive proof. Hair samples or bones, for example. It's well known and not disputed that we have black bears in East Texas, Devore counters. Nobody's ever seen a body or a skeleton of those. Predators in East Texas, which are numerous, take care of a body almost overnight. There are many theories, one, that they may carry their bodies off. After all, these are groups of them. It's not one lone animal. People have taken pictures of black bears, the skeptics note. One of those skeptics is Charlie Mueller, a Longview-based wildlife biologist for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. He managed the Cattle Lake Wildlife Area for eight years, and he said he's never seen evidence of Bigfoot's existence. If there's a bear out there, I'm going to find bear tracks. If there's a human out there, I'm going to find footprints, he said. But there's no Bigfoot tracks that I've seen. Mueller said he's studied supposed Bigfoot nests, but to him, they just looked like a pile of branches that had fallen from a tree during an ice storm. People let their imaginations take control a lot of times, and it's easy for someone to point out things that seem to be out of the ordinary that actually are not, he said. But to layman folks, people that don't know a lot about wildlife and the happenings of wildlife in their habitats, a lot of times they don't understand the normal things that go on. Fear of that kind of rebuttal, Devora and Steinegger say, keeps many witnesses from coming forward. A lot of people will think they're nuts, or if they do mention it to somebody, they'll say, Oh, it was just a bear. You don't know what you're talking about, Steinegger said. They'll kind of blow it off and not take it seriously, because there's been a lot of people who have spent a lot of time out in the woods who have never seen a thing. They're happily trotting along without a clue. Says Devore, you're going to be ridiculed. You're thinking you're nuts, so most people are real reluctant to talk. If they are going to speak to you, you've got to be real quiet about it. Of course, being in the club gives me credibility. On the Bayou it was a perfectly clear October afternoon on the bayou, and Charlie Devore sliced his canoe through red and green water, rippling under a light breeze. He had agreed to guide a reporter and photographer to the site of two Bigfoot encounters that he'd investigated only a half a mile from his house. Because the land had changed hands, the only legal access was via boat, or, in this case, an old canoe. It's better to stick to the water this time of year, anyway, he said, because it's not too smart to traipse through the woods in the middle of deer season. As he guided the canoe, he recalled his first encounter. He hadn't even realized how close he'd come to meeting Bigfoot on that night as he walked the trails near his house. I'd always gone with four dogs, sometimes five, a couple of my own plus the neighbors. These dogs generally were not afraid of anything, he said. When I hit that stench, I looked around for the dogs and realized, hey, I was alone. He whistled and snapped his fingers, but the dogs wouldn't come. They just sat there squirming. I decided the dogs were smarter than me, so I went away, he said. The next night, the same thing. It went on occasionally for six weeks, he said. I wouldn't run into it every night, but... It got to be the old hat that when I ran into the stink, I'd just turn around. He questioned hunters and outdoor enthusiasts who suggested that it might have been a wild hog, but Devore knew better. He'd smelled hogs, and it wasn't the same. In 2002, Devore heard about the annual Texas Bigfoot Conference in Jefferson. 
This year's event begins at 10 a.m. Saturday at Jefferson High School. Devore went and then returned to the bayou with some answers and more than a few new questions. After going to that conference and finding out, hey, these things have a stink, I started talking to people who had the stink on them before, he said, and the stink described was just too close to what I had experienced. At that point, I had already gotten curious about them. I talked to dozens of people who had experienced it. But stinking isn't believing, and DeVore still hadn't seen one. He gunned the boat into the swamp, past hulking primeval trees and low-lying branches toward Bigfoot. A Close Encounter When the cypress became so thick they crowded out the sun, their reflections vanished from the bayou's surface. The water instantly was black. The canoe, further now from the channel's current, cut through a sheet of scum. Devore talked above the hum of the outboard motor. Suddenly it cut out, and he couldn't get it going again. Unseen crows shrieked in the abrupt silence. Devore took the paddle and rowed through Benton Lake, a small stagnant body of water that adjoined the bayou, until the trees kept him from going any further. Over there, he said, pointing to a spot on the lake's southwestern edge. The witness had been hunting deer as he crouched behind dense brush at mid-afternoon. He reported to the Texas Bigfoot Research Center that he noticed movement in the corner of his eye. Fifty yards away, the hunter told DeVore that Bigfoot emerged from the water, stood up, looked side to side, then walked into the woods and disappeared. The hunter watched him for about two minutes. The creature was six feet tall and covered in hair from head to toe, and in the absence of direct sunlight he appeared to be completely black. Devore, having interviewed the hunter several times, deemed him a very credible witness. Finished with his story, Devore docked the canoe on a muddy bank that had built up along the edge of a massive cypress tree and fiddled with the motor. A piece of twine had wrapped itself in the propeller, and after he unwound it, it cranked on the first pole. He ordered the heaviest of his passengers into the bottom of the canoe, stabilizing it, and he took off for home. Though he did not see Bigfoot today, he knew it was only a matter of time. It exists, he said. Too many people have seen it. It exists. Story originally published by the Longview News Journal, Texas. Wes Ferguson, October 17th, 2004. This is the end of story number two. Story number three. Fort Hall, Bannock County, Idaho, August 2012. A conversation I had. All the activity mentioned is southeast Idaho near Fort Hall, like the camping trip with rocks was around Fort Hall, Idaho, where there is a lot of Bannock and Shoshone Native Americans. Every fall I drive up Highway I-15 from Southern California to Montana to hunt with friends there. I tend to find myself stopping in Pocatello, Idaho for a motel and also visit a certain bar there. Twice I have run into a man I will call Gary for this submission is without his knowledge. I had a casual conversation with Gary at the bar in November 2011. Now, before I go on, I want to mention we were drinking beer and no other kind of liquor is served there. He and I just happened to walk in about the same time and then started talking, so we were not intoxicated. Since I had met him a year prior, I felt like this was an instance of synchronicity, and maybe there was something special that he was about to share with me. So I asked him some questions. Not able to repeat the conversation verbatim, these are the answers and stories I got from him, which I wrote down an hour later when I got back to my motel room. I asked him if he was a Native American. He said yes, half Bannock Indian, 
and a tribal member. His age was early fifties. When I asked him if he had ever seen a Bigfoot, he snapped back a bit and then turned his back to me. I thought to myself, here's another person who might think I'm a nut job. But then Gary turned around slowly, and facing me, he said, Three times, he went on. I grew up in the Fort Hall, Idaho area. My earliest recollection was a camping trip as a small boy in the early 1960s. My father, cousin, and I were walking through a canyon, and something threw rocks the size of baseballs at us from afar. There was also the sound of timber cracking. My father told us we needed to leave the area as we are not wanted by the mountain people. We are the Agai people, meaning salmon eating, and we know all the good salmon runs. And tell me about seeing one. Well, I saw one in the afternoon on a dirt path below me in a small canyon. The Bigfoot was dragging a sagebrush to erase his tracks and conceal his footprints. They will also step on stones when they can to avoid making tracks. Well, you mentioned three sightings you've had. Where? Around Eel River, Trinity Forks, Snake River. Some people ask if they are real, then why are there never any bones found? Do they bury their dead? Yes, but in water, weighted down in rivers or ponds with stones. So we are talking about an animal that is shy, clever, and territorial, all signs of an intelligent creature. They are more of a spirit than a human. And at this point, Gary seemed to lose interest and change the subject. I sensed the subject of Bigfoot was somewhat taboo for him to tell me about and not meant for the non-tribal. Todd C. Homer, August 23, 2012 That's the end of story number three. Story number four. Kino Hill, Yukon Territory Kino Hill, Yukon Territory, Summer 2000 I'm not sure which summer it was, maybe five, six years back. The wife and I were returning from Kino Hill early one morning. Our coffee thermos was in the back of the truck, and it was my fault it was back there. She wanted coffee, so we stopped some miles before Elsa and got out to get the thermos and relieve myself on the side of the road. There was a stand of trees there. I wandered off a ways, walked way up there. I don't know just why I did that. It was there that I seen this bear sitting down at a carcass of elk. Maybe deer. Don't know what that carcass was for sure. Not much left of it. No rack. Mostly a skeleton. Maybe a doe. I'm thinking it was black bear at first sitting down beside the remains. But that be some unusual black bear. Bears usually stand up and tear at their kill and eat it standing up. This bear sat there, pulling it, what was left of it. Way off in the distance, there be a fox pacing back and forth, awaiting its turn at the kill. And just then, my wife yelled at me to get myself back in the truck. The bear heard her and stood up on two legs, looking in my direction. I fell backwards a bit at its size. By God, I seen it was no bear. I believe it was a boke and it had a piece of something from the carcass clutched in its hand. I don't know what. looked like weeds. It stood there looking at my direction, and the fox took off at a dead run. The wife yelled again, and this boke started waving its arms up and down, and stomping forward on one leg at me. Damn, I couldn't make these legs of mine move. I seen that it was black, and... It was naked except for hair around the usual male parts, chest, arms, and it was unshaved looking. The beard was long and scraggly with crud and stuff in the whiskers. It took a step to my direction and stomped a foot waving its arms like a crazed man might if he was high on something. 
I fell back again and started crawling like a baby to the truck on my hands and knees, and finally was able to get up and run to the truck. I saw my wife looking big-eyed at me. Behind me on the top of the area where the stand of trees was, be that boak, standing watching us get into the truck. We started the engine up and drove off, leaving the damn thermos out in the middle of the road there. My woman is Tashoni, First Nation Canadian, and I am English, and probably Micmac, though I was raised up an orphan by whites named the Thomas clan in a settlement near Nova Scotia. We married thirty-eight years ago, and her folk know the bulk, but we don't see any in our lifetime until that day. I was never taught about bulks. My woman told me what her people know. It was a shock to both of us. The bulk is a strange marvel. Yes, it is a strange sight. The wife says it is good to see one. I don't know how good having the shit scared out of me can be a great blessing, but she says so, and I listened. We don't speak about this much. The wife is still mad at me because... I lost the thermos of coffee. I could have been killed, and she would still be mad about the thermos. We don't own a computer. My friend here at the petrol stop looked up and found your website listed. So we tell you about this incident. About the bulk. We are not sure on height. I was in shock when it stood up full size and not thinking clearly, but I know it was maybe eight feet up and features fitting to its size. At the time, it could have been ten feet tall, for all I noted. I don't know what it weighed. I didn't stop to ask, ha-ha, but it was sturdy, stocky, and plenty of bulk. I weigh 240 pounds, and a mid-sized man. The bulk must weigh double what I weigh. There was no sound except the stomping sound. No smell. It was black and had whiskers and long straight hair like woman down its back and shoulders, black like shiny. There was nothing else around but a pacing fox. Nothing else I can think of. I was sure it was a black bear before it stood up and started waving its arms and stomping. My God, I get hair on my neck when I think about it. My wife said the boak is leftovers from cast-out Indian tribe. Most was killed or run off. Not many left since white men came here, and what's left is scattered and shy. They tell me the boak is skilled hunter and opportunist that works mostly after dark of nightfall. Leonard Jack Thomas Edited for Readability and Logged, April 2005 This is the end of story number four. Story number five. Broward County, Alligator Alley, Florida, 1960. It all happened in August of 1960. I was 12 years old. I was with my mother and stepfather on a vacation trip to South Florida. It was my first trip away from home. We lived in a small town, Longwood, north of Orlando, and this trip was about all we could afford for a week. I remember we headed down the east coast through Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, and on to Miami, and all the way to Key West. No interstates in Florida back then. Once we came back to the mainland, we went to the Miami Zoo one morning, and then headed west on Alligator Alley through the Everglades to Naples. It is very hot and humid in South Florida, compared to the rest of Florida, since it is in a subtropic zone. The car was not air-conditioned. I remember sitting in the back seat with my head close to the window to catch the wind. That is when I spotted it. It was standing, facing the highway, in front of a small hammock of knee-high grass, palmetto shrubs, and a few pine and palm trees, about 150 feet from the road. We locked eyes for the entire duration of the sighting. I can remember flipping back in the seat and watching it through the rear window until I couldn't see it any longer. It was not massive, but not thin, tall, maybe seven feet, 
medium brown, the color of a coconut. I could not see the feet or knees, no neck. I do not remember any facial feature other than dark eyes, and I did not see a profile. It turned its upper body as it stared, not its head. No odor. I did not say a word since it did not strike me as being unusual. We had just come from the Miami Zoo, and this was my first trip from home, and I had seen all kinds of strange animals for the first time that morning. This memory is so specific. When we arrived in Naples, I can recall swimming in the pool at the motel and thinking how hot that animal must be in all that heat with all that fur. The words Bigfoot and Sasquatch were unknown back then. I don't recall giving any thought to this creature until the 70s, when my son and I watched a show called In Search Of. Then I was so busy with work, home and family, and doing things for my husband's company, I didn't find the time to go to the library and research the subject. It crossed my mind briefly back in the mid-80s after a TV show, but nothing seriously. Obviously, this was all prior to easy access to any topic on an in-home computer. Then I watched A Monster Quest back in the first of 2008 and googled Bigfoot after that show. A whole new world opened up. Most of the sightings of Bigfoot in Florida are in Collier County, Everglades. There is one report on another database very similar to mine concerning some college kids heading to Miami on the same road and seeing a Bigfoot watch them go by from a hammock. Alligator Alley to Native Floridans is two-lane State Road 41 from Naples to Miami, not Interstate 75. It was also known as the Tamiami Trail. Lynn Chandler, Destin, Florida. That's the end of story number five. Story number six. Bigfoot creatures photographed in California's Sierra National Forest. July 28, 2009. The Bigfoot creature may have been captured on a remote trail camera placed in the Sierra National Forest, based on photography evidence released by Sanger Paranormal Society. Investigator Jeffrey Gonzalez said Tuesday night that multiple cameras were put in place in this remote area on Memorial Day weekend, and retrieved on June 7, 2009. Gonzalez said they did not immediately see the evidence, but upon closer inspection, noticed what appears to be the Bigfoot creature. Gonzalez said a group returned to the site to review the exact capture spot after many theories surfaced once the original image was released in early July. The tree stump theory was ruled out, he said, because the dark object is not there. Gonzalez said the bear theory does not stand up either because the image does not have a snout on the head. You can see features of a human face such as the nose, mouth, and chin, Gonzalez reports. The arms on a bear when standing do not hang that far down. We also took measures on how high this thing was. According to the leaves and the branches that were covering the object's face, the tape measure said it was between eight and nine feet tall. The same camera that took the picture of the object also took pictures of other objects such as black bear and deer, which does not resemble the object in any way. Photo, Jeffrey Gonzalez standing in the same spot as the object in the image. Gonzalez said that Bigfoot investigator David Ragoza has been visiting this location for six years after an elderly Native American pointed it out to him. He told David that this spot in the forest was sacred Indian land and that weird things happen here. He said David has had many individual sightings and has collected footprints, but has never captured anything with the camera until now. Returning to the exact spot where the image was captured, Gonzalez said that the angle of the hill was 45 degrees, which would make it difficult for a bear to stand upright. He also said the object was clearly brown in color, ruling out the black bear. 
The Bigfoot creature has been reported in many different parts of the country during the 20th century, including an outbreak during 1973 and 74, primarily in southwestern Pennsylvania, and investigated by Stan Gordon. During that period, hundreds of Bigfoot sightings were reported, as well as hundreds of UFO reports. No photographic evidence exists from that time although Gordon collected many footprints in that region. Aside from this single image, Gonzalez points out that there were three additional images taken several days earlier near midnight, where a bright light lit up the area. His group cannot account for how this happened, except that they are all ruling out a flashlight as the source of the light in the images. Examiner.com Photos, Jeffrey Gonzalez and Dave Ragoza comments. I don't believe the Ragoza photo of the Bigfoot shape is anything more than a naturally occurring shadow or dark spot on the background tree, and here's why. The photo of the Bigfoot and the subsequent photo of the man are clearly taken from different angles. The first photo was taken from a position considerably to the right of the position from which the second photo was taken. This is made most evident by the fact that the tree against which the man is framed is not even visible in the original photo. I've highlighted some of the most prominent visual landmarks in each photo. The Bigfoot figure in red, as you can see, it's still there in the second photo, but cropped so that only the front of the figure is visible. The leaves of what appear to be a vine maple in green higher and to the right of the second photo from their position in the original, the large tree to the left in purple, notice how no part of it is obscured by leaves in the second photo, and the line of bark texture on the foreground tree in blue. In the original photo, this line is well on the left side of the tree trunk, and the second photo, it is almost centered. I think that if one were to return to that spot, and really line up one's camera to the position from which the original photo was taken, one would see the Bigfoot standing there. It's too bad the photos are too small. If they were larger and clearer, I believe the discrepancies between them would be more evident. Seeing may be believing, but it's not always the truth. Randy Stradley, September 7, 2009 This ends the reading of the six stories. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs>